Good morning. We're going to get started this morning with an invocation by Pastor D.A. Bennett of St. Andrew's Community United Methodist Church. And that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance uh, by Hannah, led by Hannah Jones of Girl Scouts of Western Oklahoma, Troop 3569. Please stand. Let us pray. Most holy God, we want to thank you this day for giving us life and breath, and we thank you, God, for your presence with us. Lord, today we want you to know that we love our city. We know, God, that there are great victories and great matters of progress that have been made, and, and we give you thanks for that. And yet we also know, God, that there are challenges before us. And we ask that there would be wisdom for how we can best meet those challenges. For those, oh God, who are entrusted with our support, for making these decisions, we ask that you would give them wisdom, that your spirit would guide them in all they do in considering the good of all people. And in this, O oh God, we trust that you are glorified, for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Bennett, and thank you, Hannah. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and we do have some ceremonial presentations uh, at the start, and so I will do those from the front, and I'll make my way down there. Why don't we get our uh, fire chief and his uh, top folks up here first. We're a little bit into October already, so I hope. We've been working hard. <laughs> so I hope you've covered for the lack of a public presentation, but it is Fire Prevention Month. And to hear a little bit more about that, I'd ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas the Oklahoma City Fire Department responded to more than 74,000 calls for emergency assistance in 2018. Whereas during the same year, fire killed 24 of our citizens, injured 17 others, and caused property loss in excess of $16 million. Whereas the men and women of the Oklahoma City Fire Department are witness to the loss and devastation caused by fire firsthand, not only for these citizens who have lost their loved ones or their homes and belongings to fire, but for their coworkers injured or killed in the line of duty. Whereas the Oklahoma City Fire Department is actively engaged in year-round public education programs to raise awareness of fire safety to help prevent the frequency and severity of fires in our city. Now therefore, David Holt, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim the month of October as Fire Prevention Month in Oklahoma City. Well, thank you. That uh, proclamation, clearly a sober reminder of the, the dangers that uh, you guys face every day. We thank you for that. Um, and maybe you want to share a few words and maybe introduce uh, who's up here with you. Yes, thanks, Mayor and Council. And uh, right now, I'm, I'm Fire Chief Richard Kelly. We have Chief Kevin Berry. He's over our Fire Prevention Services. Uh, Major Louis Marshick, he's in Fire Prevention Services. We also call it co uh, Community Risk Reduction. Uh, Major Gre uh, Greg Bradford, uh, Major Chad Wilds, and Deputy Chief Harold Thompson's our Fire Marshal for the Fire Department. Uh, fire prevention, is, as it said in the proclamation, is something that we do year-round. We take that very seriously. But uh, when you look at the month of October, the reason the month of October is Fire Prevention Month, it always falls within the month where the Great Chicago Fire happened, where there was a lot of loss of life and, and property. And it's an opportunity for us to emphasize the importance of fire prevention. So I want to say a couple things to those that are listening, those that are uh, out in the crowd today. Um, we provide free smoke alarms at every fire station. We put them up to code, so come by and get that. 
If you have family members, make sure you practice Edith exit drills in the home. That's so important that you get out of the home, you have a way to be alerted through smoke alarms, and you have a meeting place. And we want to emphasize that so much uh, to, our, to our public, and this is an opportunity for us to emphasize that. We believe it totally unacceptable when we have one loss of life, and we want to emphasize that, and we focus this month on that and emphasize fire prevention in the city and we appreciate the support of the mayor and council and all our residents every day that support the fire department so thank you very much let's share our gratitude to our oklahoma city fire department thank you all right why don't we have doug uh, right on cue He's aware that that's on his chest. So don't, <laughs> don't feel like you need to tell him. <laughs> All right, it is time to declare trick or treat night. Uh, why, would the clerk please read this proclamation? Whereas Halloween is a time for jack o' lanterns and the annual appearance of ghosts, goblins, and strange and mysterious creatures. Whereas our city's children celebrate Halloween by dressing in costumes and visiting homes in their neighborhoods to receive traditional holiday treats. The annual Halloween activities provide an opportunity for people in our community to become better acquainted. Whereas it is important to our community that children be allowed to enjoy these traditional activities, but that measures be taken to ensure the safety of our children. Now, therefore, David Holt, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim Thursday, October 31st, as trick-or-treat night in Oklahoma City, and he encourages households to indicate their willingness to welcome their neighbors by turning on their porch and exterior lights that youngsters only call on homes so lighted, and he asks the cooperation of all citizens, young and old, in making this a happy and safe occasion for all. We are joined up here by, uh, he's in disguise, but it is Doug Cupper, our parks director. Uh, would you like to share a few words, Doug, about maybe things going on at the parks level? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, it's, it's an annual passage of right, uh, but as we become more aware of children with food allergies and, and uh, disabilities and wanting them to make sure that they have a, a, a solid Halloween uh, along with the rest of us, we always want to be Thankful that we have this opportunity, but we want to be cognizant of, of how we treat Halloween and treat our, our neighbors. So as the mayor said, as the proclamation said, uh, if the lights aren't on, let's, let's not bother that household. Let's move on to the, the next one. Be thankful, treat each other properly, uh, uh, and collect as much goodies as you possibly can. But be safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate you very much. Let's hear it for Doug. Yeah. Keep going. Julio? Want to come on up here? And over here. Well, Julio is, pending the passage of this resolution, our Teacher of the Month, and I would like to learn a little bit more about him. So I'd ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Julio Fajardo has been named Teacher of the Month for October 2019 by the Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Julio received his bachelor's degree in Christian ministries at Mid-American Christian University after attending SUM Bible College and Theological Seminary. Whereas Julio is in his fifth year of teaching, all at Oklahoma City Public Schools, he taught sixth grade at Capitol Hill Elementary for four years, and he now teaches language arts at Capitol Hill Middle School. Whereas Julio credits two former teachers, Ms. Castillo and Ms. Reyes, for believing in him and providing hope and encouragement at a critical time when others had given up on him. He eventually earned both his GED and high school diploma, and in 2015 decided to become a teacher so he too can make a positive impact on disadvantaged youth. Whereas being born and raised in the inner city, Julio is extremely passionate about community and purposefully chose to live in South Oklahoma City. He and his family have seized upon the amazing opportunities to serve and express love to their neighbors and have been involved in beautification projects, assisted several women who were homeless, 
in finding temporary shelter, worked with pet rescue nonprofits, tutored students, and worked with various mentoring programs. Julio also serves as a volunteer youth pastor at a Southside church, providing a positive role model to students outside the school setting. He challenges youth to be the change in their community. Whereas Julio considers his greatest contribution and accomplishment in education is providing the motivation and encouragement that will create a passion for learning in his students. He believes that outstanding teachers commit to teaching with rigor because they believe every student is capable of learning and has the potential to succeed. When he is able to help his students make a greater effort to learn and not give up despite their struggles, Julio knows he is accomplishing his goal of being an effective educator. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Julio Fajardo on his selection as the October 2019 Teacher of the Month by the Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Thank you. Well, we are so grateful uh, for all our teachers, and uh, it was great to hear what the change and the impact you're making in our community and in the lives of our young people. Um, I think we'll go ahead and adopt this, and then we'll hear a few words from you. Uh, Capitol Hill, you want to do this, Todd? <laughs> Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. You are the teacher of the month. <laughs> Well now, well, now we'll hear a few words from you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, actually a, a pleasure to be here. And it, I'm, uh, it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to serve uh, the students in, our, in, our, in Oklahoma City, and especially specifically in the inner city. Um, as as, as Mayor Mar Mar Holt read, I was born and raised in San Francisco, California. Um, grew up in the inner city. And I know the struggles uh, that students face. And uh, many times, uh, it seems like they, they don't get the credit or the 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 um, the support that they need, but but I'm thankful for a, a city. I'm thankful for a council, the, the mayor, and the, and especially the, the the teachers and the ministers that we have in Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, being a difficult district to uh, because of the of the background, the situation the students face. Many times, it's a record. It, it, it is looked down upon, or or the scores are not what they should be. But I do know that every day, day in and day out, we have teachers who, who pour their hearts out to these students. We have administrators who give their all, and and more importantly, we have students who, despite their struggles and the difficulties, they are resilient to, to to go to school and, and give their all and, and try their best. And even on those days when they fall short, they they, they have those to support them, encourage them. So my my uh, encouragement to everyone here is to continue to or well, first thank you. And then my challenge is to continue to believe in, in, in the students in, in uh, Oklahoma City. And I'm, I'm getting choked up because they remind me of me. But continue to believe in them, uh, support them, encourage them, pray for them, and don't give up on them. Um, because when we don't give up on them, they don't give up on them. And when we leave, they succeed, they will succeed. So just uh, thank you again for, for this opportunity to be here. And uh, to Oklahoma City Public Schools specifically, thank you for the opportunity to serve. So. Thank you. Let's hear it. Thank you. And finally, it is uh, our employee of the month, Bob Ponkilla. Bob, you've been here 36 years. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we all know a lot about you, but we can still always learn more. And so I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Whereas Bob Ponkella has been a city employee for 36 years, and he is the city treasurer in the finance department. Whereas Bob is responsible for managing the city's investment program, banking relationships, and revenue enforcement program. Bob also monitors and maintains various records, reports the status of the city's investment program, and researches, analyzes, and evaluates various sources of financial and economic data to determine the best investment strategy for the city. Whereas Bob was instrumental in helping with the passage of House Bill 1875, which benefited every municipality in Oklahoma, and he also had a pivotal role in the planning and organizing of the Association of Public Treasurers National Conference, 
which was held in Oklahoma City. Whereas Bob's service experience includes President of the Association of Public Treasurers, USNC, member of the OMC TFOA Board, member of the Oklahoma Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Education Committee, and Municipal Liaison Board with the Oklahoma Municipal League. Whereas Bob is retiring in December 2019 after 36 years of service to our great city, during which he received the Hometown Hero Award from the Oklahoma City Convention and Visitors Bureau in 2012 and was recognized as a Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association Member of the Year in 2017. Whereas Bob's hard work, dedication, willingness to serve, and enduring integrity have garnered him the respect of the municipal finance community locally, in the state, and throughout the nation. Whereas this council desires to recognize Bob Ponkilla for his dedication, professionalism, and commitment to the residents of the city of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Bob Ponkilla, October 2019, South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club Employee of the Month. Yeah, let's hear it for Bob. We have the best city employees in the country, and Bob, you're an exemplary example of that. I know that uh, Craig wanted to say a few yeah. words especially. So I had, I had the privilege to work with Bob throughout my whole career, and I've, he's really someone that I've admired my entire career, that I've worked with him. I've learned so much from him. We've worked together in the finance department. Um, he's been a great leader in the finance department. He set a great example. He really epitomizes a, a dedicated public servant. I think he's a great example for all of us. He could have won this award every month of his career, but we didn't think it'd be fair to all the other employees. And so, but he's that kind of employee, and it's just a great friend of the people he works with. And I really, I really appreciate it. We're going to miss Bob here, and uh, congratulations on the recognition. Yeah. Well, Bob, you want to share a few words? Oh, you bet. Never for loss of words. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Mayor, Council, and the Kiwanis Club for this award. Uh, but I also want to thank them for the opportunity that they provide for all city employees to be recognized for the hard work and the service that they provide to the citizens of Oklahoma City. Uh, this is truly a great honor. As the mayor said, I've been with the city for a number of years <laughs> and have had the opportunity to work with a lot of great folks. Um, it's, I've always felt very fortunate to work for an organization as progressive as the city. I began my career in the 1980s and um, I've, I've had the opportunity to see the downtown at a point in time that it didn't resemble, resemble anything like it is today. The vibrant and the dynamic downtown that we see today is quite different from when I started. Seeing the city move through this renaissance period and having the opportunity to work with a such a tremendously talented and professional group of city employees over the years has been very rewarding for me. Of course, my job is made so much easier by having a, a great staff. And they share the same goals and commitment in regard to servicing and providing services to our citizens and our customers. As I'm sure you've heard a number of other managers say before me, uh, without them, well, they're the ones who make me look good. I'd also like to thank my wife, she's back there, um, for her understanding and patience over the years for a lot of late hours and a lot of traveling. Uh, she's been great. Uh, with that, uh, please accept my sincerest thanks for this recognition. It it's truly is an honor. Thank you. Let's, yeah. Let's to keep. Hold on one second. We still have to pass this resolution.
All right, motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Bob, thank you for your career service. We appreciate you. Continuing in the office of the mayor, we have item A. We've handled item B and C. Item A is an economic development update from Roy Williams, president of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Roy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, mayor, members of council, Mr. City Manager, and Kenny, you don't look the same. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'll be very brief uh, on an economic development update. Uh, but uh, just because it's brief, I don't think means it's not important. I uh, want to uh, share with you uh, something we just completed, and that's our newest existing business report. A real component to creating this report is really capturing feedback from our existing business survey that is sent to each one of the one-on-one -on -one visits that we have with existing companies. Overall responses this year uh, from the business community are trending more positively than they did the prior fiscal year, and we believe that reaffirms that we're really focusing on the right issues and the programming and the trends that we're doing to support growth and success. Very high levels of satisfaction uh, responses continue to be consistent each year with the business environment as respondent percentages range from 91% to 100% in areas such as cost of living, cost of doing business, the quality of life, and the local business climate. We surveyed one-on-one -on -one 235 different companies. Uh, these visits have become much more strategic with a real primary focus on key industry sectors and new tools used to identify companies who are candidates for job expansion or layoff aversion efforts. So the results of these visits continue to validate the business and talent trends we've chosen in our new program strategy. With regard to unemployment, for the 12-month period covered in our report, Oklahoma City Metro unemployment has remained steady, ranging from as low as 2.7 to as high as 3.5. So Oklahoma City continues to closely trend with the nation in terms of low unemployment. Companies engaged uh, within the July 2018 and June 2019 fiscal year added about 1,400 new jobs and spent about $150 million in new capital expenses. The average wage of jobs added once again exceeded the average wage for the community. Also, it's a 92%, a really impressive number of companies indicated that their primary products and services are growing and emerging, with 69% of the companies using and adapting to new technology within their organization. And diversification is at top of mind for companies as technology continues to disrupt our economy and products and services are required to evolve and re-evolve. Companies using new technology are not only diversifying offerings, but they're also equipping their workforce with the skills that those employees need to adapt to that new technology as well. So it's a real commitment to uh, education. With regard to talent recruitment, as we continue to support the conversations around workforce and development, we have relaunched a betterlifeokc.com. Um, this will include new job listings that will be posted by key economic sectors, and they'll be used as a recruitment tool while highlighting high growth companies in the metro. And we've also launched a digital marketing program to drive traffic to that site and to encourage people to work in Oklahoma City. Um, intentionally focused on industry trends, we've created what we call talent consortiums, which are related to automation and software and cybersecurity to identify the best practices and the pool resources in the region. These consortiums help us drive better education alignment and identify opportunities for cross-industry collaboration. One of the big needs we continue to hear from our employers centers around soft skills, 
for all employees, but in particular for new employees, new managers, and sales staff. To meet this need, we're launching a full-day professional development conference called Elevate. The first event is tomorrow. It will be an all-day event at the Cox Center, and the event includes three keynote speakers, 48 different breakout sessions, and a real action-packed after-party. We anticipate more than 500 people attending this event and hoping to leave extremely inspired. Touch on Tinker for just a second. Last week, specifically Friday morning, uh, marked a major milestone with the ribbon cutting ceremony on the first hangar for maintenance of the new KC-46 tanker. This is located on the former Burlington Northern Santa Fe rail yard, which is now an integrated part of the base. And this facility now already has 150 new jobs and it will build to about 1,350. These jobs were incentivized by the state through the Quality Jobs Program, with the proceeds rebating the city of Oklahoma City for the investment in the land required for the program. So we expect the city to begin receiving those dollars very soon. A total of 14 hangars are scheduled to be a part of this program, with another two-bay hangar opening in March, and planes will start coming here next year. And we're also continuing to work on the, with the base and partners on the future B-21 bomber workload and other base security issues. Our annual inner city visit is planned to Houston on November 7th and 8th, and I want to thank Councilwoman Jo Beth Hammond and Nikki Nice, along with Councilman James Cooper, who are going to be joining us on the trip this year. We anticipate learning a lot of things, but the highlights we believe are going to be learning more about the Houston Medical Center and the innovation economy and the innovation district that they've generated around it, uh, how their downtown park has progressed over the last 10 years, uh, more about their focus on international trade and investment, their visitor economy, and we'll get to see a new bus rapid transit implementation program in their uptown area. Uh, they are getting big into bus rapid transit. And as a side note, we also recently hosted a group from Branson, Missouri last week who were taking their annual study mission here at Oklahoma City. Uh, touch briefly on criminal justice uh, and criminal justice reform. This month uh, signifies our four-year anniversary of where we started our efforts to bring together the various actors in the county system to try and move substantial change through the Chamber's Criminal Justice Task Force. We're really proud of the efforts to date. Uh, we've had basically a 40% reduction on the average population in our county jail, nearly a thousand less people in that jail today than it was four years ago when we began this effort and those numbers are holding steady. And we think there's an opportunity to even drive that number down further. So it's clear that we've been able to bring attention and community action and awareness on this issue in a very meaningful and a very impactful way. The work of the jail trust is incredibly important, but there also remains a real opportunity for the Criminal Justice Advisory Council to continue bringing together these different people who make decisions regarding data, case processing, and generally improvements in the system. So I want to thank the city for being a critical partner in making all of this effort. Last thing I want to mention, uh, and I really want to congratulate the council on the opening of Scissor Tail Park. It was a it's an amazing place. It's great to see our community there every day enjoying what it has to offer. And when you combine that with the topping off of the Omni Hotel and the new logo on the convention center, there's quite a bit happening right now in South Robinson. And rest assured that our CVB team is actively working with ASM Global and the Omni team to generate great business and economic impact from these investments. So I'll stop with that. Be happy to answer any questions relative to this if any council members have any. Councilman Greenwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Roy, uh, the history of Oklahoma and Oklahoma City is we have highs and lows in terms of our uh, economic performance. And a few years ago, we were going through one of those low periods. And to me, it seemed like we were generating some national attention, but not in a favorable manner, and, and the problems we had with funding education. Did you ever see a change in either perception or when you do these surveys, and 
If so, is it now on an upswing, or can you talk in terms of outside perception of the state? You know, we're making very incremental improvements. Uh, we still fight the battle. We're still a flyover area. People still perceive Oklahoma City like they do Oklahoma. And Oklahoma City is very different from Oklahoma, but yet we're here. And so how Oklahoma is perceived, we get perceived. Uh, one of the other things, too, I wanted to mention, and you mentioned education, that still is really kind of at the top of the list of concern, uh, and it's K through post-grad. It's the number of people coming out of our system. It's the quality of coming out of our system, and that continues to be an issue to employers. It also is an issue to companies we're trying to recruit here. They want to know about whether or not our educational system can produce the talent that they need to be competitive. So it, it's going in the right direction. Unfortunately, it's probably not going as fast as we would like to see it. Thank you. I'm really excited to hear about the KC-146 tanker being here. It'll be here next year, and I'm excited to hear about these 1,300 new jobs that will be created. But what I'm kind of unclear on, can you explain what the rollout is for that, those 1,300 jobs? Is that over a two-year period, five-year period? What is it? Uh, probably a little bit longer than that. Um, when we were out there Friday, we were in the first hangar. And that's, I mean, just get this in your mind. It's 55,000 square feet and only one plane fits in it, and there's only about six feet of clearance on either side. So this plane, the, these tankers, are, whether you take the width or the length, are longer than half of a football field. So these are gigantic planes. They have a capacity of taking off with 412,000 pounds. So we were in one building. Across uh, the, the runway is another two-hangar building under construction that will open in March. Adjacent to this one is another single hangar under construction, and adjacent to it will be a triple hangar where three planes will be able to go into. So those will incrementally be built as the Air Force receives those tankers. Eventually, after all are delivered, there will be somewhere, I think, around 180. So like every six days, there will be a new plane coming in to tinker into those 14 hangars for maintenance, repair, and overall. So it's, it's incremental. But at full capacity is when they will be at that 1,350. Any other comments or questions for Roy? Thank you, Roy. Thanks Thank for you, the presentation. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate Thanks. it. All right, still on Office of the Mayor, we have items 3D through I. These are appointments to the Board of Adjustment, the Bond Advisory Commission, the Oklahoma City Park Commission, Planning, Zoo Trust, and the Port Authority. We can take them with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Journal of Council Proceedings, items A and B. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item five, request for uncontested continuances. We have item 9A1 listed on the agenda, seeking a deferral to November 19th. Anything else, Mr. City Manager? That is the only item we have today. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it shall be. Item six, revocable permits. Item A, revocable permit with VI marketing and branding for Carne Diem. Uh, we have... Robbie. Good morning. Um, this is our 17th annual Carne Diem. It's a chili cook-off to benefit the United Way. Um, due to ongoing construction at the First National Building, we're moving over to Kerr Park this year. We made the pivot, and Daniel helped us get the revocable permit put together. So we're really, really excited this Friday. So we're right up against the line <laughs> with the last second permit. We'd hope to see you down there this year. <laughs> Well, I probably will not make it. I do not eat meat, so I'm a little outside of the event, but I will motion for approval. Yeah. Awesome. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. I believe there are two vegetarians, so come on down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Item 6B, revocable permit with the Susan G. Komen Foundation for the More Than Pink Walk on October 26th. And we have Alyssa Pope, who signed up to speak. 
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So I know it's a little different when you see Susan G. Komen more than Pink Walk. Um, over the last 25 years, we've had, had our race for the cure. And this year, we decided to change it up a little bit and do something different and get the communi community more involved with our um, signature fundraiser. So this year, we're doing our inaugural More Than Pink Walk. And um, so far this year already, our numbers um, are significantly up. Um, we have more corporate uh, teams um, engaged, and I think they are more prone to walking more than running. Um, and then also with that, with moving from the race to the walk, we were able to save over $30,000 so that that way we can invest more money into our community. Um, this week we did receive some numbers um, showing what we've done in the community over the past year. And last year we were able to provide 1,203 women with mammograms and we were able to provide over 5,000 navigation services to the women of Oklahoma City. And that's just navigation services, meaning they got transportation to doctor's appointments, they were able to get diagnostic services. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're doing um, from our event that we do every year. So we're excited for this Saturday, for sure. <laughs> Great, um, Councilwoman Hammond. Well, it sounds like a wonderful event. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yes, I would probably be more inclined to walking than running as well. So uh, I will motion for approval. Okay. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 6C, revocable permit with the Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust and Heartline, Heartland Weimaraner Rescue, might help me out with the pronunciation, Carrie Irvin, who has signed up to speak, to talk about the 2019 Ghost Runners 5K on October 27th. You got it right. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the Ghost Runners 5K Dog Run, this is the 10th annual event. Um, it is to support Heartland Weimariner Rescue. It's a local nonprofit dog rescue. We also support other local rescues in the area. Um, we do have a 5K that is a timed event for people to participate. You can run with or without your dog. We also have a fun run, so if you don't want to run, don't want to walk that far, you can absolutely participate in the fun run. We're going to have vendor booths out there, as I said, other rescues, businesses to support. Um, we're also going to be taking donations with blankets, towels, things of that nature to share with our local animal shelters. So lots of opportunities to support in different ways. You can come out, bring the family, obviously bring the dogs, <laughs> um, and just really kind of you know, participate in the event. It's from noon to four out at Lake Hefner Stars and Stripes Park. So we'll have costume contests, all kinds of other events throughout the day as well. All right, thank you. Congratulations on 10 years. Thank I would you. move the item. <laughs> Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. 6D, revocable right-of-way use permit with the Plaza District Chamber of Commerce to hold Day of the Dead in the Plaza District on November 3rd in Shelley States. Good morning. Um, this is the sixth year for our Day of the Dead Festival in the Plaza District. It has grown every year, and last year we were informed by the police officers that accompanied our procession that we needed to close the street. So we're really excited about doing it this year. Um, we do have a procession um, at 4 o'clock. We also have food trucks, vendors. Um, we have ofrendas, which are altars to people who've passed in people's families in the community. We offer a community ofrenda. Um, this year we also are going to have roving mariachis at a point and a stage with lots of folkloric dancing and uh, performance by Linka in the evening. Um, and it's a great community event. It brings people from all over, from Dallas, from Lawton, from Tulsa. Um, and we're just really excited to have this on November 3rd. Great. Councilwoman Hammond. Well, I'm really excited to hear that uh, it's gotten so big, you have to actually close the street down. That's wonderful. Um, and I will just make the plea to everyone who does live within the city to be good neighbors um, to the uh, neighborhoods on either side of the plaza. Um, and I think I've said this before multiple times, but one of the biggest complaints I got 
um, while knocking doors in those neighborhoods was just parking, um, people yes. not following the parking signs in the neighborhoods and parking on both sides of the street, which gets dangerous for emergency vehicles. Absolutely. So to be able to welcome our friends from kind of the suburbs, Lawton, Tulsa, um, so that they have room to drive into the city and enjoy this. I would ask anyone who lives near uh, enough to take the bus or bike or scooter or any, you know, you know, walk, whatever, um, to do that and help just alleviate that burden on the neighbors so that they can all enjoy it. So we do promote people taking Uber to the Yay. event. Yeah. Yay. So I'm glad to hear it. And I appreciate the work y'all are doing to keep that um, stretch of the street vibrant. So I'll move for approval. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. NBA season tips off this week, and our home opener for the Thunder is Friday night, and so it is time to consider a revocable right-of-way use permit with the Professional Basketball Club to hold Thunder Alley October 25th and 27th, November 2nd, 9th, 10th, 22nd, March 2nd, uh, I'm sorry, March 4th, 20th, and 26th, April 1st, 7th, 10th, and 17th, and we have Brian Pack here. Good morning. Um, my name is Brian with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, I'm here in regards to our pregame fan fest known as Thunder Alley. Um, it's the same as uh, several years now. It's going to be on Reno between E.K. Gaylord and Robinson. Um, we will have several activities uh, that we will try to activate throughout Thunder Alley, uh, such as live music and um, play areas and sponsorship activities. Um, it'll be three hours prior to tip off on all those dates um, and about six in the fall and then about six in the spring whenever it gets a little warmer. Great. Thank you. Councilwoman Hammond, Councilwoman Nice. Well, I'm not wearing my blue and orange for nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm excited that we're about to thunder up and the season officially starts today for NBA, period, <laughs> if you did not know. Um, and I think tomorrow is tomorrow first away game? Yes, against Utah. Season. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know we'll all be following our thunder and, of course, Friday. So I'll be at Thunder Alley. I ask that you all meet us in Thunder <laughs> Alley and let's enjoy and support our brand new team. <laughs> our brand new team that we have for the Oklahoma City Thunder. We're excited about it. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I'll move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thunder up. Recess council meeting now, and we will convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Uh, we have on this agenda items A through J, and I don't believe we need an executive session on item I. We could take them all with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We now adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A through D we could take with one motion. Move the items. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We now adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we have merely claims and payroll, but we'll vote on it anyways. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust and reconvene as the council meeting, where we find ourselves on page five, item seven, the consent docket. I know we have one presentation scheduled uh, for item AE. Is there anything else that a council member wants to pull out for separate discussion or vote? Beautiful. All right, AE. Eric, you're up. Eric Winger. <laughs> Thank you, Eric Winger, Public Works Director, Oklahoma City. Remind me which item we're starting on. I just. AE. AE, okay. AE is the resolution um, authorizing the city engineer myself to actually affect some additional changes to the Oklahoma City Boulevard project as the project nears its completion. Um, to do a little bit of a background on the project, there have actually been a number of items that the city has previously authorized on the boulevard that were in addition to the original schedule work. So the work of the actual Skydance Bridge, the sound walls along Interstate 40, the pedestrian tunnel that connects the MAPS 3 park um, the scissor tail park that recently opened that goes under Robinson was a part of some of those extra activities. But as we work towards the completion um, with ODOT on the final project, which is expected by the end of this year, there's a number of additional items that we're forecasting that we'd like to complete, which will be more cost effective for the city to have ODOT complete them than for us to contract them separately. And you'll find those on the second page of the memo, but outlining those briefly, it's 
uh, resurfacing of portions of Walker Avenue, Robinson, Harvey, and Western. It's signalization of the OKC Boulevard and the Harvey intersection. It's a replacement of some curb and gutter. All the features that are attaching our city street system to the boulevard itself. Um, total cost of all these items is right around $950,000. We've made funds available for these types of improvements that would be affected by change order to ODOT um, through 2007 uh, listed and unlisted bond funds that uh, were, were part of that uh, bond authorization. So no additional funding is requested with this item, but just the authorization to proceed with these final improvements as we work towards the final boulevard completion. So with that, um, I know that there's some other questions that may occur on the boulevard. Um, the city does have a number of other projects that it's contemplating. There's been a lot of questions about the intersection of Klein and the boulevard. The city is advancing um, the design and the construction of a signal at that location that's not included in the items today. Um, we're also looking to restudy certain other areas as the boulevard opens and actually becomes active. We're seeing traffic patterns change. Something that as we see more traffic use the boulevard, the city is going to be a position to, to review, possibly make additional changes as we go forward. Um, but I would in, not anticipate those until after the boulevard's turned over to the city of Oklahoma City. And again, that's expected by the end of this calendar year. So I'm happy to answer your questions on this specific item with this authorization to have ODOT complete some work. But then again, additional city work can be expected here in the coming months as well. Hey, Eric, I might have been asleep the last couple of years. Did you say we've got an underground tunnel underneath Robinson connecting the park? So there is. Um, so if you are on the southeast corner of the Scissortail Park, there is a, a tunnel um, that allows you to get underneath Robinson Avenue um, near the south end of the park, just near the Skydance Bridge before it goes over Interstate 40. So it's near the Union Station. Um, but it's a pedestrian tunnel that is there since the roadway is elevated at that location. I see. Thank you. It's completed. It's, our, it's there today. I was just going to say, it sounds like a field trip. We need to take <laughs> Underground, it, it goes under the road. So it's not something, it's, it's, uh, it's at grade, so it's at the level of the park. Um, so you're not actually going down into the ground. Um, it's, it goes through the road. Can you paint a picture? As to where we are on landscaping aesthetics, uh, big picture, uh, what's the final goal and what's the timeline for all of this? Right. So um, landscaping on the boulevard has been a project that's always going to be, was going to be completed by the City of Oklahoma City, um, not part of ODOT. ODOT did make the appurtenances ready, so the irrigation, the sleeving for the irrigation system, um, getting ready the tree wells that are, that are through the center section. So if we divide the boulevard into three sections, the west section being west of western, the east section being east of E.K. Gaylord, the center section then being between Western and Gaylord. The landscaping is already underway on the west and the east sections. The landscaping is nearing completion on the west section. On the east section, we're actually making some intersection changes at Oklahoma Avenue, and so the final landscaping there won't be completed until those intersection improvements are 100%. ODOT, now finishing that center section of the boulevard, has made ready all the tree wells for all the new trees. And those are evident today, so if you were to drive the boulevard, you'll see all those are ready. Um, but So the city will be coming in. The contract is already in place, but we just need the transfer over to the city of Oklahoma City. We're starting to get some of that early work underway. But you can expect a tree-lined boulevard, much like Project 180 through this intersection. On the west and the east sections, um, it's been designed more as a gateway to downtown. Um, and so you see with uh, landscaping rock, with flower beds that will be planted in the spring, with trees, a mix of, of landscaping as you enter from either Interstate 40 corridor, Interstate 44 from the west into downtown, or if you're coming from I-35, I-235 from the east, about where you hit the theater, um, the U-Haul building, um, you're going to see a, a, an amount of landscaping that will be planted there this fall. It'll all be completed here in the next few short months. We weren't able to do a lot of the landscaping in the middle of the summer. There was some, some, uh, some trees that did not survive that have been replaced, but, but nearing completion on the west and the east, the center very soon. So from a landscape perspective, uh, weather permitting, we're less than six months out for yeah. completion? Yes. Okay. And Thank contracts you. are already in place. There's no additional approvals on those required by the city council. Eric, would you remind us the lighting uh, timeline for the boulevard like when we would expect lighting to appear from that west entrance from 44 slash 40 coming into the city so the lighting in the three different areas was installed at three different times um, on the west end 
um, to be west of the western area. The lighting is in, but it's not fully functional. It's been one of those areas that has suffered from copper theft, and ODOT is committed to making all those necessary repairs before it's actually turned over to the city of Oklahoma City. The center section has the lighting completed. It has the P180 style lights, and they're active today. Now, there may be a few sections that don't have their final circuitry completed. My, my trip in this morning, much of the center section is already lit. The lights are functioning. Um, on the east end, um, much the same. Um, the lighting's been installed, it's operational. That section's been completed um, by ODOT, so if there's a light out on the east section of the boulevard, um, we need to turn that in for service and get that repaired. But uh, west and east ends are complete, the center section's coming online, and if there's some wire theft um, issues before the turnover, ODOT will address those before the city receives the lighting system. When did the west end complete? Um, the west end lighting was installed um, probably more than a year, year and a half ago, but it has suffered copper theft. So even though the poles are upright, um, the lights have not been on regularly. Because, yeah, when I was arriving back into town from my New York City trip for the transportation conference, it was just like straight darkness. And I don't take interstates when I can, or even that boulevard, uh, except for the downtown center part. I, I was, I mean, I, I, I knew we had this street light problem. I did not quite fully appreciate how darkness. <laughs> so, so ODOT is committed to making all those necessary repairs before it's given to the city of Oklahoma City. Do, do, when? All of this is supposed to be done by the end of this calendar year. That's what I thought I remembered. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Eric? Joy Reardon has signed up to speak on this item. <laughs> um, one big issue I've got is... So can you pull the mic just down a little oh, bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah. The one big issue I've got, well, two big issues. Uh, the from where Western is down to uh, 44 on the west side, there has been some serious copper theft on the south side of the street. I don't know if y'all... I've called in and probably 12 times within the last month. Uh, the other thing is they're walker, they're replacing all the curbs and gutters, but they're not putting any kind of sidewalk in. If you're going to improve the curbs and gutters, why not put a sidewalk in? Instead of filling it, filling in the area with dirt. So, so I'm happy to respond to both those. So on the, on the copper theft, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation is very aware and they've committed to making those necessary lighting repairs before the city receives the improvements. Um, the Walker Avenue resurfacing, um, there is not a sidewalk at those locations currently. It is one that could be conceived in the future as those businesses redevelop, but obviously sidewalk connectivity is something that we look at with Bike Walk OKC. Um, and so, um, I don't know that there's a plan to install the sidewalks today, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a future plan. But street resurfacing and sidewalks are not part of the same project category. Um, so we, we simply just complete them at different time frames based on, on their priority, either in bike walk or through our street resurfacing program. The whole deal is what, what sidewalk is there, they're actually ripping out and throwing dirt in there. There is side, some sidewalk there, but they've ripped them out, putting in the curb and gutter and uh, put dirt back. So I, I can look into this further, but I mean, I just need to investigate a little bit more. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I will back. Um, someone has signed up to speak on item 7K1, Linda Byford. You can, yeah, right there. Perfect. Good morning. I'm uh, inside counsel with One Oak Incorporated in Tulsa. One Oak owns an easement that ha holds a natural gas liquids pipeline uh, within the boundary of the property that is subject to the Sienna Ridge um, letter of credit and dedication that is before you today. Uh, One Oak has attempted to negotiate an encroachment agreement with Sienna Ridge, and they have not been um, accommodating to us, uh, although we would be more than happy to be accommodating with them. They've built a road. They're talking about putting in a um, drainage pipe over our easement, over our pipeline. We're concerned about the safety of the pipeline. We're concerned about the integrity of the pipeline because we don't know for sure what they're doing. They haven't been willing to work with us. And we would ask that until we're able to reach an encroachment agreement with Sienna Ridge that ensures the safety of a natural gas liquids pipeline, 
that they not be allowed to proceed with this project. Mr. City Manager. So the project is completed, right? The work is completed if we're receiving the dedications? Yes, this is to accept their uh, letter of credit. They have put the street improvement in. Uh, we put a map up there. It's right there on the uh, east side of that plat. And typically this is a, uh, the property owner and the pipeline company reach the agreement and it's not a party to the uh, rezoning or the platting of the property. So. Typically the property owner and the pipeline company do reach an agreement that has not happened in this case. We weren't given notice of the preliminary plat. We were not given notice that the, at the time that the road was being built, we knew it was planned. We didn't know that it happened until after the fact. We know that there's a drainage uh, pipe that they're talking about putting, again, over the easement and we're concerned about erosion over the pipeline. We know the depth at where the road is, but we don't know the weight of the construction equipment that they're going to bring across it. We don't know for sure the integrity of the pipeline, and we don't know that because they haven't been willing to work with us. But, but our acceptance of the letter of credit and the um, dedications doesn't, I mean, the, the, it doesn't include the drainage, right? That would be a separate issue? I don't believe the drainage is involved in this. And you're, you're saying that the drainage has not been constructed yet? I, that is my understanding, but they're not telling us what they're doing. So if it was done since last Thursday, we wouldn't know. There are drainage improvements there are. in this. Your, uh, I think what, do the you want us, what do you want us to do? I, I would like to pause this project. I would like to not accept their, their letter of credit or their dedication until we've had the opportunity to reach an agreement that ensures the integrity of the pipeline, the safety of the pipeline in the community, and honestly, One Oak's rights here. We're concerned about future encroachments. We're concerned about utilities going within our easement. And we're not having the opportunity for communication that we'd like to have. We're not trying to prevent anything from happening. We're trying to ensure the safety and integrity of the pipeline. The, the city's issue with accepting the dedications is once the road is constructed, it will be our road. So we will have the road over the pipeline. So we haven't done a title search or anything to see whether we had any type of easement in there before. And, but if, if their easement is prior to ours, that means anytime we need to do anything to the road that's going to go underground, we would have to pay. And our decent, yeah, our any, anytime they have to maintain their pipeline, they can go in and tear up our road, and then we have to reconstruct it ourselves at our cost. Get it? I get it. Is anybody from Sienna Ridge here today? Yeah. Oh. Brad Reed, the Craft and Toll, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, so we have been in touch with. Uh, the 1-0 pipeline since the very beginning. Um, the issue here is the encroachment agreement. Uh, developers are unwilling to sign the encroachment agreement um, on, the, on the basis that the city does require at the very end, the city is the one ultimately that does have uh, the responsibility of those roadways. Um, the encroachment agreement in, implies some uh, liability on their side and uh, they're, they're unwilling to sign that. Um, we believe that's a private matter though um, between the developer and the uh, pipeline company. It is until we accept the easement, then it's going to end up being a city issue. Yeah. Um, would it be possible um, for us to pass this to the next meeting and uh, maybe the two parties could get together with Kenny and sit down and talk about their differences and see if we can resolve this informally? You mean defer it? <laughs> All right. We... Councilman Greenwell has taken that as a motion and he has seconded it. And are you thinking the next meeting, two weeks? Yeah, the next meeting. Okay. Are you okay with that, Councilman Cooper? I mean, when we're dealing with the liquids pipeline and safety issues, I think. It's in Ward 3. Oh, I'm sorry, Larry. I, I thought it was in James. <laughs> and this is the first I've heard of it. I just asked a very simple question. Would a two week continuance be appropriate, Kenny? Yes. That's what's been motioned. So. Then seeing that, uh, have you made that motion? He did. And has it been seconded? It has. And let's call the issue. <laughs> All right. We've got a motion and a second to defer item 7K1 for two weeks to the next meeting. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item is deferred.
talk to Kenny after the meeting and, and try to get something up, set up, please? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Is there any other item on the consent docket that anyone wishes to talk about? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt all the items. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Moving on to item eight, the concurrence docket, items A through H that we could take with one motion. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This brings us to item nine, items requiring separate votes. Item A1 was previously deferred to November 19th. Uh, item 9A2 uh, is at 301 Northeast 13th Street, going from R1 to SPUD 1138. Uh, this was deferred September 24th and October 8th. Councilwoman Nice. Uh, thank you. Um, I know we're still having some conversations, so I'm going to ask if we defer that again. Because um, I know we. Uh, good morning, David Box, 522 Callcord Drive. Um, so my understanding was that uh, the height that you'd like simply doesn't work for the project. Um, and I know, uh, as we said yesterday, or I never received any word back as far as yesterday was concerned, that um, we still don't know what the applicant wants to do. So that's why I know we were trying to work together to figure out what our options are. So that's why I'm asking that we continue that conversation and defer it once more and then come back to the table and, and then we vote on that conversation. Um, because this came late Friday as far as what the ask was uh, from the applicant. And uh, as of yesterday afternoon is when the response came and we did not receive, I didn't receive any word, um, correct me somewhere, I didn't receive any word of what the applicant wanted to do and here we are today. So that's why I'm asking now we defer it one more time and we come back to the table, we have another conversation, and then we'll be ready to come back to the table and vote on this item. Um, certainly, let me ask my, my client. So the, the, on the height issue, um, what was given to me from staff was that 50 feet was the tallest building um, that, that you felt comfortable with. And they went back, they're engineers, they're architects, it simply doesn't work. We need the, we have to have the 70 feet in order to, to make this project work. But let me ask my client if he's willing to take two weeks. So the concern is. I, mean, I, I can rush it and, and do what, what I, I had planned on doing anyway, but I'd rather have us have a conversation and then we defer it and come back to the table. It, and I, I, I think he's, he's okay with doing that. I just, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna waste your time or the council's time uh, because the 70 feet is what they have to have. But Well, I have all day. So, I mean, we, we have two weeks and we can continue to have this conversation and that's what I'd rather do, continue to have this conversation instead of um, offering the, the concern that I have and flat out saying we can't do this. So let's, let's work together to see how we can make this work. We're happy to do it. We'll, right. we'll take the two weeks. I, I just, like I said, we, what we were told was 50 was a hard number, and that just simply didn't work. But okay. Well, we can still we'll continue, continue the again. conversation and, and see where we go from there. Fair enough. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, I move for, for us to defer this two more weeks. Okay, we've got a motion and a second for a deferral uh, to the next meeting of item 9A2. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item is deferred. Uh, I have to recuse from item 9B, uh, and so Vice Mayor Greiner will be presiding. And uh, item 9B is a uh, closing of Fred Jones Avenue between West Main Street and West Sheridan Avenue. Um, is the applicant here? Uh, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, we have um, Joe Beth. Yeah, um, well, yeah, so this is simply closing Fred Jones, um, like you said, between Maine and Sheridan. And um, if you all could talk a little bit about what you want to use that space for um, and just kind of what the purpose of closing it is, I'd love to just make sure everyone has some education and then, yeah. Sure. Paul Lefevre, 522 Colcord. 
with me today uh, from the applicant is uh, Megan Holscheiser. Uh, Megan, would you like to make some comments? Or yeah, you want of course. Me? Okay, great. Yeah, so um, Fred Jones Avenue between uh, Maine and Sheridan is now surrounded by some of the new development. We've got the 21C uh, Museum Hotel, we have the Jones Assembly, and then we have the West Village Apartments that have all been developed in that area. And our kind of goal for this area is to be a walkable, uh, pedestrian-friendly area. We want to create a neighborhood feeling. We have the string lights across it connecting the area. We have... Um, a lot of great restaurants and um, the plant shop and everything surrounding it. We have the live work units, which uh, are uh, retail spaces that then have um, people living and working in the same area. So the idea is to create a very walkable, uh, pedestrian friendly area. And by closing this, we'll be able to uh, ensure that and keep the neighborhood uh, going. We've done a lot of improvements to the street to make it a nicer, friendlier uh, space to walk on. So uh, if you guys go down to the area in the evenings, uh, you'll see a lot of families walking around, strollers, bike racks um, to encourage that. So uh, if you have any questions. Well, thank you for that description, and I will motion for approval. Uh, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9C1. This was an ordinance on final hearing. We uh, had a presentation a couple meetings ago. This is about cell towers in design districts. And this would be the consideration of the ordinance for final passage, pending a motion. Got a motion in a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Um, we also have item 9C2. This is a resolution amending uh, the Oklahoma City Historic Preservation Design and Sustainability Standards, I assume, to conform with what we've changes we just made in the ordinance. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we have items 9D, ordinances on final hearing. These are all I think, regarding parking. We've got 9D1, removing the no parking any time restrictions on the south side of Northwest 90th Street. Councilman Cooper. I, was, I don't believe this is anything anyone would have signed up to speak. Probably not. Regards no. to, so I would move approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D2, establishing a 90 degree angle parking within a setback parking area on the north side of Northwest 12th Street, etc. Councilwoman Hammond. Yeah, do we have anyone signed up to speak on any of these, Francis? No. no. Okay, I'll just motion for approval. Motion in a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D3, establishing two reserved parking spaces for the physically disabled on the north side of Northwest 12th, etc. Councilwoman Hammond? I will motion for approval. Got a motion in a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D4, establishing a two hour Time limited parking on the east side of North Dewey from Northwest 11th to approximately, et cetera, et cetera. Councilwoman Hammond. <laughs> I will motion for approval on that one too. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 95, establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled on the east side of North Dewey, uh, et cetera. Councilwoman Hammond. I will motion for approval. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 90. Six, establishing a two-hour time-limited parking on the north side of Northwest 11th Street, uh, et cetera. Councilwoman Hammond. I'm actually going to motion for denial of this. Um, specifically, uh, I, I'd like for, I think Jesse is here for the streetcar to discuss. Um, I know he, it sounds like he came forward during the Traffic um, Transportation Committee to discuss how this could negatively affect their operations. Um, and I went out and looked at the area last night and it would be that situation where there would be parking right along the tracks. Um, and uh, when I spoke with him, he said that, um, you know, when they have to tow a car, it can delay the streetcar 20 minutes or longer. So in my mind, it just seems like we're creating problems for the streetcar and making sure that it's running well. 
um, by adding opportunity for people to make the mistake of parking over the white line. <laughs> Um, so I'm in a motion for denial on this item. What is there now, just out of curiosity? Um, there's a sidewalk. Okay. Yeah, so we would have to, or I guess the applicant um, who's creating this development would have to tear up the sidewalk and create a new one um, to create the space for cars. So there's no park. parking at all along that stretch? Not right now. Okay. Okay, so we have a... I lost my place. This is a motion to deny Will nine. Does impact any way any of the property owners that are currently there as far as conducting their businesses? Have we heard from the landowners, talked to them? Is this something we may want to do and defer this? Um, so the, the development that my understanding that's requesting this is actually building a parking lot on the backside of their development. So, um, I mean, they'll have plenty of parking and we just approved some parking spaces that would be along Dewey that would be street parking for their clientele. Um, and so in my mind, you know, if we're going to create more parking spots, I'd like them not to block the streetcar so that the streetcar seems like a viable option to people and it, because it's not getting delayed. I, I agree with you. I'm not advocating more parking lots and, and I understand what you're saying and I do agree, but don't you think we ought to hear from the developer, the landowner to make sure we're not doing something adverse to their project, just defer it for two weeks, hear from them, give them a chance to speak to us? Not really, no. <laughs> it's public space. It's not their. We would be. We're. We be. We're. At, we are voting to change public space, and in my mind, that's our purview, and not necessarily. Yeah. Their. I'd like to defer it for two weeks just to hear from. Well, there's a motion on the table to deny it right now. Okay. Is, is, but there's. Is there a second for that motion? Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Um, if that fails, then we can consider a, another motion. Um, all right, so this is a motion and a second to deny item 9D6. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Uh, motion fails four to five. Item is still sitting there. I'd move to defer this item for two weeks or to our next uh, council meeting so that the, we can hear from the, the landowner developer. Okay, we've got a motion for a deferral now till the next meeting, two weeks. Is there a second? Got a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Motion to defer passes. One, two, three, four, five, six to three. Okay, item is deferred. Moving on, 9E1. This is a public hearing regarding uh, the Western Avenue Business Improvement District. Uh, this was previously introduced and discussed, I believe. Um, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this public hearing regarding the Western Avenue Business Improvement and District? Seeing none, 9E2 is a resolution adopting and confirming an assessment role uh, for the Western Avenue Business Improvement District. Mayor, mm -hmm. uh, is Eric Winger around? I think. Yes. May I ask a question for him about Western Avenue, real quick, in terms of the commercial frontage? There was a sign that was damaged earlier this summer in June, and I would like an update on when a repair of that sign might happen. Eric. Eric. <laughs> Doing constituent work, very important. Yes. Very important. <laughs> Councilman Cooper had a question on uh, an issue on Western Avenue. Do we, do we have an update, I, just when I saw commercial frontage along Western, do we have an update on the sign that um, was damaged earlier this year? I feel like we spoke about this, you and I. Western and Cross Street for me, the 41st or? Yeah, I think that's about right, yeah. Oh, we did talk, yeah. Did you, is, is that the location that we're talking about? I'm sorry. Yeah, the one that was damaged hit earlier this summer in June. There was a Western, like, uh, streetscape sign that was hit and so I'm aware of a Paseo district sign that received some damage that is being replaced and then there's also one in the Windsor Hills district that was a was a streetscape a monumental sign that is also being repaired but I'm I'm not a I'm trying to think of a Western Avenue one that's also been struck that needs repair we can talk about it after the meeting it happy just came up when I okay. looked at that I was like wait a second so but. absolutely happy to follow up with you on that thank you you're welcome Does anyone wish to move the resolution adopting and confirming the assessment role? Second. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Um, OK, 
Okay, so Pat. Yes. Councilman Cooper, you mean to be voting against the assessment roll? For, it's okay. You can if you want. I just want to. <laughs> Passes unanimously. All right, now we're at 9. F, ordinance on final hearing, adopting and setting the assessment role for the Western Avenue Business Improvement District. So this is the ordinance. Is there a motion for this? Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. 9G, ordinance uh, to be introduced and adopted with an emergency. This is correcting uh, our fire prevention code. And do uh, you want to say anything about it, Craig? Yes, yeah, so Paula Kelly is here with the Municipal Counselor's Office just to kind of give us a description of what we're doing here because we do need to pass this just to introduce it, adopt it, and do it with an emergency just to get this correction in. Good morning. So on September 24th, the council took action to amend the city's fire code by adopting the 2015 International Fire Code and in a true display of the power of the pen inadvertently repealed the uh, enforcement provision of the code that uh, empowers our fire marshal and deems our investigators and inspectors as peace officers. So we would like to reenact and recodify that provision, which is this ordinance before you. Uh, the repeal of that provision in the code will take effect on the 24th by and through the emergency. Uh, if you pass this today, then this will also recertify or recodify and reenact this provision of the municipal code on the 24th. So there will be no gap in uh, the services and the provisions of the code. Okay. So you're asking we move the item today and then move it with an emergency? Most certainly. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Move the item as an emergency. Second. Motion and a second for the emergency. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9H, this was uh, second of three meetings on this uh, ordinance relating to sewer and sewage disposal. It's specifically related to uh, wastewater uh, treated wastewater fee uh, in a relationship we have with OG&E. Right. It's being sold OG&E for the Red Bud facility, and we just needed to add that into the um, schedule of fees. So this is the second meeting on this topic, which means it is the public hearing meeting. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this public hearing uh, regarding this ordinance change? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 9I. This is an ordinance to be introduced, set for public hearing November 5th and potential final hearing on November 19th, uh, relating to our general schedule of fees. And I believe we have a presentation. Yes, so Jared Beatty is here from Municipal Council's Office to present us on this item. Good morning. This is an ordinance relating to event permit fees for the North Canadian River Corridor Recreation Area, which includes the, Oklahoma, the Oklahoma River Corridor. Uh, the, the recreation area is managed by the Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, and it is a popular location for local events. Currently applicable event permit fees have been in place since 2010, so this ordinance revisits those fees and creates a few new permit options. The updated permit fees correspond to the Oklahoma River zones that are, are displayed on the map before you. Updated rates are daily rates rather than hourly rates. River trail permit fees are also updated to be daily rates. The ordinance establishes a new permit category for river basins uh, so that event organizers would no longer be required to rent adjacent land zones for water only events. For commercial fireworks displays, the ordinance establishes annual or per event options. And finally, the ordinance establishes uniform processing and deposit fees, and it codifies cancellation and refund policies. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you. So we would need a motion to introduce the ordinance for consideration. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. It's introduced and set for public hearing November 5th and final hearing uh, potentially on November 19th. 9J1 and 2. Um, 9J1 is a public hearing, but let me first describe uh, 
what it's about. This uh, 9J2 is a resolution uh, to be introduced, set for final hearing on November 5th. Uh, maybe now is the time to clarify that. So this is a, well, you've got a presentation. Yes. Go ahead and the amendment there. Go yes. ahead. So uh, Chief Kelly is going to make a presentation on this item. While he's coming up, I'll explain. There was a correction. It was reposted on the agenda for item uh, 9J2. There was an amount that was incorrect just on the agenda. The items in the resolution were all correct. The numbers in the resolution were all correct. But it changed it from an increase of $150,000 to $100,000. The total amount was still cor correct that it's not to exceed $250,000. Good morning, uh, <clears throat> Mayor, Council, Richard Kelly, Fire Chief. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Just want to give you a quick overview and kind of a historical review of, of, of this program. But when we look back on our advanced life support program, that's a focus that we started a little over 20 years ago. We actually, in agreement, an MOU between the local and the city, in 1997 98, we agreed to start this advanced life support program. The goal of that is to uh, move all of our advanced, all of our engine companies to advance life support uh, capability. And what that would entail, we would have a paramedic on every engine that responds out of the fire station. Currently, we're at 32 of our 37 engine companies, very close to completion of that program. Some of the challenges we have through that process is that we, we hire paramedics and we have a preference on that but the challenges that you have is the market. When you look at the workforce market out there, there's not a large share of paramedics that are available that may be even interested in the fire service. We do recruit in that area and we focus on that, but we've noticed over the years when we get about five, probably an average of five to 10 paramedics at most in our, paramed in our recruit schools, we're not able to actually get enough paramedics to fully enact the program. When you look at that, uh, we have a total of 254 paramedics currently. Uh, 236 of those are in the field. There are, there's also some challenges in this process that we see of retirements. We see some personnel that are coming up for retirements. Uh, currently we have 69 personnel that have 20 plus years of service. Now what we look at that when we're planning and our long range planning, most of our firefighters retire with an average of about 27 years of service. So we've been uh, focusing the last three years of really emphasizing our recruitment inside the fire department we're paying and training our personnel to actually get paramedic training and to be able to provide that service to our residents. We believe that's the best way to focus because we have personnel that have already met the, the uh, values and the expectations of our department, so we want to train them. So the goal in this program is to increase the funding in that area to train personnel. Currently, we have 20 of our personnel they are enrolled in the OSU program, OKC, that are what's the P1 program. That's a very beginning program of the paramedic training. We have 14 that are enrolled in the P4. So they're about to graduate. Actually, in December, we'll have 14 new paramedics through that program. And then we have four that are currently in the EOC program. And what this funding will do will actually solidify that funding to train those paramedics to get them all the way through the training. So we appreciate your support continually in this program, but that, I want to give you an overview of that. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank you very Thanks, much. Chief. After that, I want to go back to 9J1 now and ask if there's anyone here to speak under the public hearing regarding the issues just discussed by Chief Kelly. Okay? Yes, yes. Michael Washington, 2900 Northeast 18th Street. Gallant effort, sir. Number one, safety of our citizens should be foremost of concern to all of us. Now, this gentleman, I believe, stated he had more than 260 paramedics available and, and the majority of them on the streets. I'll tell you what, I love that because you can never tell. I mean, I've actually seen some people being sick enough to work. And let me tell you, tell you the response time from uh, this man, this gentleman's department has been very well. Now, everybody knows Michael Washington. If it were not so, I wouldn't say it. Now, so again, I'm just going to briefly state that yes, uh, whatever he needs, give it to him. And if I can help out, let me know. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak under this public hearing? Seeing none, uh, back on 9J2 now, the resolution to be introduced. Is there a motion to introduce it? Got a motion and a second to introduce the resolution. Any discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Set for final hearing now on November 5th. 9K is a joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority approving the Oklahoma City Convention Center booking policy. I would note that we earlier in the meeting while convened as the PPA already approved that. Uh, take a motion. 
Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9L is a resolution establishing a revised policy which identifies responsibilities and establishes guidelines relating to the receipt, safeguarding, deposit, and reconciliation of city funds. And I believe we have a presentation. Yes, so I asked Bob Ponkula, since he was here for employee of the <laughs> month, to go ahead and come back up and make a quick presentation on what we're doing with this uh, project. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Bob Ponkula, City Treasurer. Uh, just a quick overview of what you're reviewing today. Uh, this is a, an update to a what we refer to as a cash handling policy that was established back in 2016. Uh, at that time, we saw a need, we identified an, a need to establish some more formal and consistent controls throughout the city. We realized that there were around 70 different areas within the city that was taken in money if some, in some form or fashion. Uh, and we had around, I think it was around 130 cashiers, cash handlers throughout the city. So we established the, the this policy, and it was very broad in 2016. It outlined some general requirements for me as city treasurer, for department directors, and also for cash handlers in the different departments. Um, as part of that policy, we basically I was provided some direction to establish some guidelines for departments to follow if they had cash handlers in their area which I've been doing over the last several years. We've visited with departments, uh, their staff, uh, have further refined the controls that we feel like need to be in place. And so since that time, the, um, we've continued to refine the guidelines and we felt like we also were at a point to where we needed to update the authority and the uh, responsibilities of, again, myself, department heads, and cash handlers. Uh, also during that time, as part of the policy, we were responsible for training all the cashiers within the city. I think we set a one-year deadline for that for ourselves, and we were able to achieve that. Uh, but since that time, we've trained over 250 cashiers and, and cash, uh, cashier supervisors uh, over the last three years. Uh, that's because of turnover and that sort of thing. We, we get people through all the time for this training. Um, currently, the policy before you, again, it refines, it updates uh, some of the authority, the responsibility for me uh, to enforce these uh, responsibilities that these departments have, but also, uh, again, updates and refines the department head responsibilities and those of the cash handlers. The thing that we did this time was we incorporated the guidelines. We established some formal requirements now that the departments will be required to follow. There are very solid controls that are minimum requirements that the departments will now follow. Um, with that, we'll continue to monitor the, this document. It'll continue to be dynamic because of changes in payment processing and this with technology, those type of things, and we'll continually bring this back. Well, I won't, but this will be brought back to all of you for approval and updates as we, uh, we continue to get smarter. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. You bet. Thank you, Bob. All right, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Cast your votes, passes unanimously. 9M1 is a resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of Martinez, et cetera, v. City of OKC. I don't believe we need executive session. Move the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. 9N1 is a joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority authorizing the firm of Collins, Zorn, and Wagner. Uh, to represent municipal employee and Oklahoma City Police Officer Cameron Burwell in the case Walker v. City of OKC. I uh, don't believe we need executive session. Move the joint resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
901 is a resolution approving the settlement agreement with Hilltop Plaza for settlement of Oklahoma County District Court case, City of OKC v. Hilltop Plaza. Don't believe we need executive session. Move the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9P1, claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on these claims recommended for denial? Don't believe we need executive session. I entertain a motion to deny the claims. Move the claims be denied. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 10A1 uh, is claims recommended for approval. Don't believe we need executive session. Move the claims be approved. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 11 is items from council. We are on, uh, we'll start with item A. Uh, this is uh, the historic preservation amendment that's been discussed uh, at the two previous meetings. Um, this would potentially be uh, the first uh, shot at final hearing. I have inserted myself into this discussion uh, in the last week, and Councilman Stonecipher and Councilman Greenwell, would you mind if I discussed what I had, what I've drafted? Do you want to go first? And I was, I was hoping you'd take the lead on this. That you did a <laughs> wonderful job in helping us to revise, uh, revise this. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it's in your packet. This was distributed on Friday. Uh, the exact language, but but let me set the foundation by saying. As I always understood it in conversations with Councilman Greenwell and Councilman Stonecipher, the, the concern was um, who could essentially, uh, you know, uh, establish these temporary designations and, and whether it was, um, you know, appropriate that that, that power was held um, outside the purview of elected officials. And, and so to further define that, I want to make sure we all, we all are on the, using the same terminology and all on the same page. So there's what I call temporary designations. Some people call them moratoriums or stays, but for sake of clarity, I'm trying to go with temporary designation versus permanent designation. What I do not think anyone has been concerned about has been the permanent designations, which require seven votes if the property owner does not uh, approve or agree with it. And I don't think anyone seems to think that that needs any adjustment. Um, and we're also not talking about any type of application where the property owner is supportive of it. That's, nobody seems to have any issues with that. So we're talking about the very narrow situation um, about temporary designations that can last up to 180 days in our current ordinance that are not supported by the property owner and who can um, uh, approve those. And so that's what I tried to hone in on on what I drafted um, last week which you would find in your packet, but it basically says that in those particular situations where the property owner does not support the designation, um, that the temporary designation issue would go to the council at its next meeting uh, and requires a simple, simple majority vote, not a supermajority. Um, and if approved, then the temporary designation would be in place while the process goes on. If not approved, the temporary designation will not be in place, but the process will still go on um, and of course, at the end of that, in this scenario I'm describing, without property owner support, the permanent designation at the end of that process would still require a supermajority. I believe this addresses the issue um, that was first brought forward uh, by Councilman Greenwell and Stonecipher, and nothing more and nothing less. <laughs> and that was what I want. That was my goal. Yeah. And Mayor, I agree. But just to sure. Help. Sorry, just to help a non-attorney mm -hmm. understand. And it goes back to the temporary, temporary versus permanent. Uh, so if, if a measure does not pass the simple majority, you say that it's still under consideration. But what does that mean in terms of what the property owner can do and cannot do with respect to their property? The, in this case, since the temporary designation has not been essentially ratified by the council, uh -huh. they're, they are, the property owner and the property is back where it was before the process started. There is, you know, kind of, there had to be some sort of little delay built in here. So there is this up to 20 days um, where essentially they have a temporary designation automatically by virtue of the fact that the, the HP or the Planning Commission started the designation process. But then it goes away and they're back where they were. Uh, yeah. before with full rights as they had before. Okay, could I use an example? Sure. So let's say the HP or the Planning Commission on the 1st of February mm -hmm. uh, initiated the process and our next meeting was let's say
February 14th, for example. So let's pretend we had a meeting on February 1st as well. Yeah, but they, let's say they met after we did. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's two weeks in between the time that they met and when we met. And then on the 14th, we met, but it didn't receive a simple majority. Correct. To yeah. continue the process. So it's only been 14 days. At that point, does it cease having that temporary uh, yeah, if, application? If, if, if there isn't a majority vote, uh, then paragraph eight does not go into effect and there's no prohibition. Okay, that's fine. And yeah. I think, I don't want to speak on behalf of Councilman Stone Cipher, but all we were trying to achieve was the ability to bring this question to the city council to make that decision when the property owner does not want it. Right. And I think this achieves that. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Just briefly, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to comment uh, time and time again when we discuss this, I said that we need, to have, we need to have more discussions. We need to revise this. We need to keep working on it. And I want to thank uh, Brian Davis, Eric Groves, David Box, Janice Powers, Scott Connor, Kenny Jordan, Laura McDivitt, Amanda Carpenter, Alan Brown, and Scott Cravens and others who all weighed in on this, had input, and that's when we work best, when we work together and we sit down and talk to each other. And this is a perfect example of it. Um, I will tell you on a humorous note, uh, when, when I saw what the mayor had drafted, I said, I can't believe you did this. And he said, you know, Mark, I drafted legislation for eight years. <laughs> and what I meant by that was, I don't know how you found the time to do it. You did find the time to do it. You did a great job and I want to thank you for it. Well, thank you. Um, and we also had discussions with Councilman Cooper and I'd like to have your take. Um, what, what have you thought about over the last week with this draft? Uh, well, I wasn't expect I, w I wasn't planning on speaking, um, <laughs> which I know might sound strange. Um, well, I want to thank the mayor for drafting this proposal. As I, as I've said many, 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 many times with this, I, I, I just thought this was a hammer to us to a gnat, and so I appreciate that the mayor's language in this proposal is very narrow uh it allows for um it, yeah i just i think it i think it's fine i think my only yeah I, I said last meeting i really don't want to keep speaking on this um but i appreciate the opportunity to do so <laughs> uh so i guess my only question would be in the event that it comes back to council um for that five four vote or whatever vote it is mm -hmm. when um uh, a property owner doesn't want the designation that moment that if let's say council didn't um, approve that designation for them they can immediately go demolish the property is that correct which they could have done three weeks before as well right I mean but yes yeah I it's I guess that's what I mean when I say the hammer to the nap, because already with the existing process, we were going to have to go up against that 7-2 supermajority at the very end. And that's next to impossible. So already it was going to be within the purview of city council. That's why I never understood this conversation. Um, and I've listened to this conversation. Didn't just hear it, but I listened to every word of it. So, you know, I think this, this accomplishes what it needs to accomplish. Um, I look forward to us um, you know, addressing this, I guess, more in the future later. Okay. Any other comments? In which case, I guess I'd make a motion to amend your previous introduced ordinance to substitute this language. Does that sound like a good motion, Kenny? Second. <laughs> okay. All right. We've got a motion and a... Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, what I just moved was to basically replace the previous proposal with my proposal. So you're now voting to. May I ask? Yeah. <laughs> to the other two council people who have a lot more history in your wards and designations, how do you all feel? Well, I, th I think, uh, as you know, silence speaks volumes. Um, so basically, no, 
we, we still don't like it. Um, because as we've continued to say and have this conversation before, this conversation should not have been brought forward by those who do not have these historic properties in their prospective wards. And that affects our wards the most. Um, and, and no, I, I don't. I still don't, I still don't like it, uh, regardless uh, of what, what the amendments are, what the outcome is, because as you just said, there's still, regardless, there's still the opportunity for demolition of these historic properties. And we know the history, especially when it comes to um, our communities uh, and those lower income, those underserved, and communities of color that have been at the disadvantage because of of uh, our properties being demolished and destroyed. So no, I don't. I don't agree with that. So I just want to clarify, nothing here makes anything easier to demolish that is than... No, I don't think, I, and, and let me say, I, I get that, but mm -hmm. the, the fact remains of the conversation that we continuously have to have when it comes to demolition, eminent domain, and all of those things. Right, okay. Did, are there any citizens no, no one signed up to no speak, but up. You know, go ahead. But Lord have mercy. Y'all know y'all had me kind of squibble squabble for a minute. No, 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 no. For the most part, there's no question that I live in a community blighted, almost depleted of monies and funds, although we know this gentrification thing is coming in. But then again, you have to also realize, too, that there are very prospective buildings and properties that are likely to be destroyed with this redestination and amendment that the mayor, I believe, honestly uh, tried to amend. But when you have a council person and our persons who sit before you and themselves state that this, they don't believe it's a great idea, then quite naturally, and then me seeing that it uh, had no protection for the property owners, of those who may not be around and know that their properties are subject to be dismantled or destroyed, disrupted, disregarded, bulldogged or taken advantage of. It seems to me that it's all designed to for the city to come in and usurp, as they've already done for many centuries and years, to come in and take properties that rightfully they don't belong to them, but rather to the people who do own them. I think it's just a way of clearing up for the process of this eminent domain to come into the forefront and also to help this, for the most part, innovation district to develop more so. In the districts where there are history, buildings, centers, monuments, and things of this nature, we have to consider that because that is some of the very fabrics that made America and Oklahoma what it stands for today. Independence, strongness, Viability, encouragement, destination, recognition, all these things. And for me to stop by one day and see something that's not there and may have actually, for the most part, and people don't live over there, it may have actually inspired me through my everyday walks of life. Knowing that, hey, I walked down that street. I used to live in that building. I used to throw rocks at that building or whatever the case may be. I can't speak for the others but myself. I certainly hope that this amendment isn't passed. Thank you very much. So we have a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I just like hearing from multiple people on this. Um, as I said, Mayor, I really do appreciate the way you crafted this, but I'm still a bit, a bit torn, especially after hearing Councilperson Knights nice there. Ms. Lewis, I'm, you didn't sign up to speak, but if, is, is it one of, would you mind? If, Ms. Brittle, Katie Brittle, what staff? Is there any you, any thoughts on this? Yeah, everyone keeps getting caught off guard. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I did it to you. You're just paying it for. May we call for the vote, please? Well, um, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, we don't need to fish for. Uh, what we're sure. doing, council person, is we're listening to people's interpretation of this ordinance and trying to arrive at a conclusion that will best serve our community. So yeah, I think we do need to listen to different people's perspectives on this. And so far, no one's offered to come up. 
All I'm doing is asking for okay. a vote. We don't need to discuss whether we're going to vote or not. We're going to vote. Uh, is there any further discussion on the, there's a motion on the table. There will be at least two votes here. There's a motion to amend what has previously been introduced to substitute the, the new language previously discussed, and then there would be a motion, and then there would be the potential vote to adopt that ordinance change. So this, the motion on the table is simply to amend and insert the language that I've previously presented. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, cast your votes. That motion passes six to three. So to clarify, you're voting to keep the language. If you're voting no, you're voting to keep the language as it previously was. All right, six to three, passes. Second vote uh, potentially would be a motion to adopt the ordinance change. Motion to adopt the ordinance. The second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the ordinance change? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes six to three. Okay. Now we have item nine, uh, I'm sorry, 11B. This is an ordinance to be introduced and adopted with emergency uh, amending ordinance number 21,141 to extend the 180 day moratorium to a 269, 269 day moratorium on the acceptance of applications for processing of and issuance of PUDs, building permits, and certificates of occupancy uh, in the 73111 code for businesses described as small box discount stores, et cetera. Councilwoman Nice. Yes, um, this um, is in front of you, again, only because of the timing constraints that we had. And we want to make sure if we're doing this, we're doing, this, doing it correctly, one. And two, although 269 days seems like a very lengthy time, it's really, it's actually the end of January. And considering that, our planning commission will only meet once this month and once, if I'm not mistaken, once this month and once in December. So that obviously slows the process down uh, for us to continue as we're working through the healthy uh, neighborhood overlay district and the fact that we have to give notices to over 7,000 residents that are in the 73111 zip code. So it's a, a, a timely prompt process. And again, we want to ensure that it is correctly done. So I, I don't want any missteps when it comes to the community being informed about what's taking place. So that's why we're asking for um, you all to uh, allow this to be adopted with an emergency for just uh, as we get through the holiday season and um, be able to execute and bring back that healthy neighborhood overlay as it has to go through the process through our planning commission. And I know Amanda, if is, was that, that good? Councilwoman, you've got it all. That was all great. Right. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. So with that, uh, I'm asking for approval uh, through that so we can work through this right now. And a motion and a second for the ordinance. Excuse me. Yes. I'm supportive of this, but may I ask, are you all looking at other restrictions? Because this may not be the only comp competition facing uh, the success of a grocery store uh, in retail any other retail facility is at least indirectly uh, in competition with the retailer. So are we looking to expand this beyond just the small box stores? So the ordinance will be directly on point for small box discount stores, but the planning department is doing other outreach and other measures in order to try and affect the food desert that's currently in place on seven, in the 73111 uh, zip code. And my point is convenience stores fast food uh, restaurants, all of those compete and, and take a portion of the expendable funds that could be used at a full service grocery store. So what you're saying is you are looking at further restrictions. They're definitely looking at additional programs and when you'll see when the ordinance does come to council for introduction that the definition of small box discount can apply potentially to some of those other um, locations like convenience stores if that's their primary business. Right. I'm just suggesting, are you trying to expand it to include such things as fast food restaurants? The Healthy Neighborhood Overlay District Ordinance would not specifically apply to fast food. Um, it's planning is looking at all of the options that are on the, on the table, but the Healthy Neighborhood Overlay District Ordinance would not apply to fast food. And currently, um, there aren't many fast food restaurants that are in that particular zip code right now. Um, and, and with that, as we're moving through even this overlay district, uh, we're, we're not going to continue to keep it. This is right now just something that we want 
to see the outcomes and, and once we get the desired outcomes, we'll lift that. But it's a continued process of continuing to speak about health as far as healthy options. And even now, as you know, with some fast food restaurants, most of them offer healthy options on their menu. So if we're even able to encourage those healthy options, if people desire to go to those restaurants, there's still options for those people. And one of the things that I forgot to also mention, and I want you to consider as well, as you know, we've had a, a really um, a structure change in our planning department. So while they have continuously been doing the work, uh, that has also had uh, a reason for why we're asking for us to uh, ask, come back and ask for this to be delayed and, and inserted for 269 days as far as our moratorium is concerned. Um, so again, we're not going to stop asking and letting the community know about healthier outcomes because this is one of the ways we can show that we are committed to healthier outcomes. And to mention again, uh, as we know, we just celebrated breast cancer awareness, and I want to go back to the fact of health. Breast cancer, one in every eight women is diagnosed with breast cancer. In that same zip code, 73111, it's two times higher. So that means every two women that you touch or see in the 73111 has been affected by breast cancer. So this is a very grave concern, and we want to make sure, I'm not wanting to implement and say you have to be healthy, but we need to introduce healthy options. If they don't have a healthy option, you know, shame on us for not allowing them to have that. And again, I move for approval. <laughs> All right, so we've got a motion and a second. This is the ordinance, and I take it we're going to want a second vote for the emergency, right? Is that okay? So this is uh, the first vote. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. And I ask that we move with emergency, please. Got a motion and a second on the emergency. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. 11C, ordinance be referred to the Planning Commission for recommendation. So this is, uh, this is an ordinance to be referred to the Planning Commission for its comment. This relates to communication services by amending the type of permit required for towers from a special permit to a special exception. Councilwoman Nice. Yep. Um, Councilwoman Nice had actually raised this issue about our process, the permitting process for cell towers, and really brought up a good point where we would get into technical discussions at the council meetings about cell towers and ask if there's another process that we could follow. We worked with our um, cell tower consultants and they helped us working through an ordinance. Bob Tiener is here, our development services director, just to kind of give an overview of what's being proposed in this, line, in this uh, ordinance. Just briefly, uh, the current ordinance allows uh, cell cellular towers and broadcast towers is a uh, conditional use in most districts. And those conditions are basically height and separation from other towers. What this ordinance would do so if they exceed the height or the location, then they have to apply for a special, per, uh, special permit, which is what you see every Tuesday when, when those cases come in. What this ordinance would do would change that to a special exception and send those requests to the Board of Adjustment. Um, we're also going to do a couple of additional things. One of them is to require three, ta three antennas on each tower to co-locate, which will, should reduce the number of towers. Um, this item just refers it back to Planning Commission, then we'll review it from there. If there's any questions? Uh... I just want to thank everyone um, after we raised the question, after that last zoning request, um, to be committed to looking into this further and for us to now have this plan of action, I think is, is, is really great for us to move forward when it comes to looking at those cell towers. So I appreciate everyone's effort, especially our city staff, and, and thank you, city manager, for allowing us to investigate and look into this further. So with that, I move uh, that we, this is just an introduction, do we need to? This is just, yeah, this is just a vote to send it to the Planning Commission for and comments. I, I would move that we move that forward to our Planning Commission. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. All right, now we'll go around the horseshoe, Councilman Greiner. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And again, I want to say thanks for um, your amendment this morning. 
Um, I appreciate that language. I think it made things a bit better there. Um, when I was a student at Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, one of my professors used to make, not make fun of me, but um, she used to point out that whenever she would assign a reading to us, that I was the student who would turn to the other students and ask them what they thought of, about what we had just read. So you all got to just experience that with me. It's just, it's ingrained in who I am. Um, I would note also, as we move toward Halloween next week, which many of you know I'm a big scary movie fan, um, but I, I wanted to point out that we're coming up against, uh, I believe, the 502-year anniversary of what I think is one of the scariest moments in all of human history. And that's the moment where a monk asked humanity to think for themselves, Martin Luther. It was all Hallow's Eve, as you might recall, right? And for many, many years, um, it was taught that only the, the clergy could interpret the Bible for you. And at the time, and many of you might remember this, I just think it's very important that we as a species re recall this history, uh, especially in a country that believes in the individual. But it was Martin, right, who read the Bible for himself and realized that at the time, unfortunately, the Pope had not been honest with everybody, saying that the only way you could get into heaven was to pay the indulgences for the forgiving of your sins. And people believed it because there really was no public education. Right? As, you're, as a teacher on council, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. It, the, the idea that you could read for yourself the idea that you could comprehend what you read for yourself and that you might have a different interpretation than the person next to you, this was really unheard of. Um, and so when Martin actually challenges that moment with his 95 theses and hammers it on the door, it's on All Hallows' Eve, right? He knew that everyone would be in church the next day and they would see it for All Saints' Day. Right? And I do believe that one of the scariest things on planet Earth is the idea that you as an individual have to think for yourself. You have to interpret for yourself, that you do not have to rely on somebody else's interpretation of reality. That's scary, but it's liberating. And as someone right now at the college level who's teaching uh, English composition and teaching the, a thesis, uh, we revisit this history. And I really, truly, in my heart, believe that if this city is going to be uh, running around calling itself part of a renaissance, then we must revisit that moment 502 years ago where in the middle of the Italian renaissance, Martin Luther asked people to think for themselves. It was only around that same time that poor William Tyndall, who also asked people to think for themselves in England, was strangled at the stake and burned alive for the, quote, sin, the heresy of adapting the Bible translating the Bible out of Latin into English. We wouldn't have a Bible to read in English today had it not been for what William Tyndall did in England and for what uh, Martin Luther did in Germany. I would hope that people listening to this are not bored because without this, you do not have Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and the slave Mumbet uh, here in, right after the drafting of the Constitution who as a young slave is working in slave quarters and she hears talk of a new constitution saying that all of us are created equal. And she goes, oh, all of us? I think that means me too. And that's because she was able to interpret that Bible for herself. This is the importance of the individual. And when you heard earlier our um, Chamber of Commerce representative Roy Williams say that those soft skills are really where we're kind of lacking right now in this city, I have a suggestion. We should, every teacher, K through 12, should be doing everything we can, not just encouraging our students to read, but to read for her or himself, to interpret what they're reading, and then have conversations about it. And as we move through kindergarten through senior year, the better we develop that ability to speak our voices. And I have to tell you, as someone right now at UCO and OCU, a lot of the students struggle with that. And they tell me that the reason why they struggle it's because what's missing in kindergarten through 12th grade too often are these sorts of conversations. We should not be afraid to teach Martin Luther. We should not be afraid to teach William Tyndall. We should not be afraid to teach Mumbet. We should 
embrace it and let students come to their own conclusions about the nature of reality. Critical that we do this. A couple other things, I'm not done. This was something I've been waiting for. October is literally my favorite time of year. Uh, speaking of history, I had the honor of attending the uh, public transportation conference in New York City. I want to thank COPPA, my fellow COPPA trustees, uh, for uh, inviting me to go. I want to thank Embark for inviting me to join them on that as well. I got to attend a session on funding sources for public transportation, kind of thinking outside the box and with the upcoming BRT that we have coming from a matching federal grant uh, for Ward 2 and then the two more that MAPS 4 has proposed. Uh, learning about funding sources, particularly as it relates to operations, is very important. So it was very uh, exciting for me to be able to attend that session on funding sources for public transportation. Love taking the subway. I got to take the subway down from Times Square, where our hotel was located, to the World Trade Center for the first time. I had never seen that memorial. And as someone who's now representing a city, also touched, unfortunately, by um, monstrosity, um, very similar sort of ideological monstrosity, in fact. Um, it was a very calming, um, peaceful, and reflective site to visit. And if you have not had the opportunity to visit um, the monument there in New York City, I would encourage you and your families to do so. Um, I feel very connected to New York City because of our own um, monument to um, resilience. Um, while I was there, I also uh, took the subway back from the memorial to another memorial, the Stonewall Inn. I mentioned to you in June that the Stonewall was the site of uh, many, many, many years of police brutality and police raids on people who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender for the simple crime of existing. It was illegal, as you know, until 1971 in every state but Illinois to have those sort of same-sex attractions. It was common for you to be arrested, have your name printed in state papers, uh, your home address printed in those state papers, your place of employment printed in those state papers, and uh, violence very commonly enacted upon your body. But on that night, June 1969, the people of Stonewall fought back and now that is a national monument, um, historical site, honoring really what we consider to be the birth of the LGBT um, movement uh, for equality and equal rights under the law. Uh, the idea that the individual has the ability to interpret their sacred text for her or himself. Once more, the legacy of Martin Luther continues uh, although I would point out that he's borrowing a lot of that from Socrates uh, about 2,000 years before him. Um, I would also point out for anybody who's interested in not just the more tragic side of LGBT history, uh, but what we've contributed to this society and societies all across the world, I would encourage you uh, to watch a documentary called The Celluloid Closet. It's about the history of uh, queer cinema. And there are so many movies from The Birdcage uh, to um, movies like Moonlight that won the Academy Award for Best Picture. But The Celluloid Closet can tell you that history a bit better than I can. Although, if you want to grab coffee, I'm happy to. I would also point out that November 1st, 1893, was the invention of cinema. And that was Thomas Edison. And uh, the very first film was Life of the American Firefighter in 1903. Uh, we had our fire folk show up here today, and that was really the first time that we realized that we could use this new invention to tell stories, and we will continue to do so. Um, I also wanted to congratulate Tamaya Cox Ture for her appointment to our bond advisory board representing Ward 2. She will do an excellent job, I have no doubt. Sean Webster to our community action agency. Same to him. I think he will be an incredible uh, asset for our city, and Chelsea Banks our community commission board as well. I also wanted to congratulate those who attended the National uh, Period Day last week. I think it's important for men of every age to stand beside uh, our uh, neighbors who are uh, women and who are trans, uh, who experience this and uh, help them speak their truths. I think that's critical. And um, 
two final things. I told you I had a, had a lot today. Um, two final things. I'd like to thank uh, Boomtown author Sam Anderson for joining my UCO and OCU students this week. He surprised me with a text message Thursday morning saying that he wanted to join my OCU Arts and Human Values students and my uh, UCO English Composition students for a special screening of the horror film Candyman at Pony Boy on Uptown 23rd. For those of you who have not seen the film, it's really about the uh, historic horrors of segregation and city planning. And it was really great to have Sam bring his research about how our history with racism and city planning, unfortunately, back in the day, created some, um, some, um, some obstacles that we're overcoming today. Uh, but I really want to thank Sam for being there. The students burst into applause when they realized he was there, and then they burst into applause when the film ended. It's a really, really great film, scary indeed. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank Police Chief Gorley and uh, the new recruits for uh, Oklahoma City Police Department for allowing me to join them last Thursday uh, for a trauma-informed police training session. I'm not a morning person. This was at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm not going to lie. I told the chief yesterday I was dreading it because I just wasn't going to be quite awake. But for three hours, I was riveted. And the city should be too, because right now your police force is learning about how mental health, they're learning about how what happens to a child from literally the time they are born until that age of 18, and really until the age of 25 when our brains stop forming, has shaped who they are as an adult. And they're learning about adverse childhood experiences, ACE. They're learning about those scores and how those higher scores lead to increased risk for heart disease, obesity, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, all kinds of substance abuse. And I am honored to live in a city that is asking its police force to adopt best practices and how they're going to uh, interact with our citizens. And this is new and I think incredible that we're heading in that direction. And as somebody who is the first openly uh, LGBT person on this city council, who knows the history of police brutality, who knows the history of, um, of what it was like to live in a closet, to know that our police department has grown and has moved past that. What a great month. What a great day and what a great future we have ahead of us. So all that to say, I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Mecht. Councilman Stone. <coughs> we have a big day Saturday morning. At, uh, yeah. Starts at 9 o'clock. We have the ribbon cutting out at the Draper Lake Trail. So. If you haven't seen it yet, I'd recommend, certainly invite everyone to attend out there. It's going to be fantastic. It's from 9 to 1. Uh, there'll be a lot of fun things going on. So thank you. Yeah, exciting. No, thanks. Um, yeah, so thank you, Councilman Cooper, for mentioning National Period Day. Councilman Nice and I got to attend the rally at the state capitol on Saturday um, to just bring awareness to the um, lack of access even so many people in the United States and in our state and city experience to period products like tampons, pads, and menstrual cups. Um, we, Councilman Nice and I were, and she mentioned this at the rally on Saturday, that we were privy to a conversation about a woman in our county jail who was on her period and had um, the, the policy over there is to only give folks a um, a certain number of products for the month and so regardless of um, you know what your own personal uh, biology is um, it, hers with her period was lasting longer and she actually had maggots in her cell because of um, how much she was bleeding and how little um, access she had to appropriate hygiene products so um, it is a real um, uh, issue for a lot of people in our city and our state and um, and I know from working at a homeless shelter that um, that is one of the items that is uh, they are always in dire need of um, because if you live outside you can't store those products um, and, and holding on to those is just near impossible um, let alone affording them so um, I just appreciate um, my constituent Jennifer Mayo for um, putting the rally together this was the first time she'd ever organized a rally and it went really well. We got to um, put together some packages with um, tampons and pads to 
donate to a group of students who created a nonprofit to collect and donate uh, menstrual products to um, to people in need. So um, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in putting on that rally and um, just kind of bringing and raising our awareness of um, you know the lack of access people have in, even in our own communities when we think that probably it should be pretty easy. Um, and actually, I just wanted to kind of read a few statistics that um, the uh, group put together. They did a, a survey of 1,000 students throughout the country, and 84% um, of the students surveyed said that they'd miss class time or know someone who missed class time because they didn't have access to tampons, pads, or menstrual cups. Um, and knowing that that is affecting people's education, it's affecting people's ability to interact with um, the workforce um, is is something I think that we should really be aware of and um, think as a city how we can help provide that access um, more and, and just at least promote awareness. So um, thanks to Jennifer and all the, the youth that put together the rally on Saturday. And um, also to piggyback on that, if you did not know, Oklahoma is one of 34 states that still has a, a they call it a tampon tax where are taxed on uh, your feminine hygiene products. So hopefully I know um, though there's some work that's being done as far as lobbying to eliminate that tax. Um, there are a few things I did want to discuss and talk about, but first of all, I want to send a, a great kudos to the ladies of Chums Incorporated. They had their national conference in Oklahoma City this past weekend and they are a national nonprofit, and their goal is for women to use their talents to service the community. And we literally had women from LA to Virginia, New York, all from all literally from West Coast to East Coast. Uh, so for those ladies to be a witness to what's happening and seeing cranes and seeing construction in our downtown Oklahoma City, that's what they spoke about. They said there's movement here, and they were encouraged by what they saw. And on Saturday evening, I do understand that the scissor tail was colored yellow and green for their colors uh, to commemorate them being here. And next year, this is the first time they've ever had their convention in Oklahoma City. Uh, there, next year, they'll be going to Cincinnati, but they said they had a really good time in Oklahoma City, and I and I think. That's, that's what 1OKC is, that's the Oklahoma standard, and, and that's what we're about when it comes to welcoming those who have probably never been here before. And I know one lady I spoke with was from Philadelphia, and there, she said, um, she was telling her friends she was coming to Oklahoma City, and she, they asked her if we still ride horses. You know, I mean, but those are some of the things that people still think. Unfortunately, when it comes to Oklahoma City and Oklahoma, and I want to also send a kudos to the Chums Oklahoma City chapter. This year they awarded $2,000 to Martin Luther King Elementary School. And that donation was for uh, uniforms and for uh, those who are underserved at that school to be able to have clean and fresh new uniforms. And um, we do have a few Chums that have worked for the city and we have one that currently works for the city. So it was, it was a, a smiling opportunity to see ladies that are actually committed not just working for our city, but also doing work in the community. And I think that's what also uh, makes this city great. Uh, a couple other things, as we talked about Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I do wanna let you know again about the My Sister Myself event. It's October 29th at Mary Mahoney from five to seven. They're giving free mammograms. They're also offering transportation and more. And also on um, October 30th, the Integris Mobile Van will be doing screenings at the Greater New Zion Baptist Church from 3 to 6 p.m. So there's two opportunities for our community to be engaged and involved with uh, mammograms. And again, as I said, uh, our breast cancer rates are two times higher in just the one zip code. And again, men, you are not excluded from breast cancer, so be mindful of that. Um, and I wanted to also make mention, we didn't do, do a resolution for or recognize, but I wanna publicly recognize, again, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is this month. In Oklahoma, uh, the numbers are an average of 85 victims per year lose their lives to domestic violence. And every day in the U.S., more than three women are murdered by their husbands or boyfriends. And Oklahoma is ranked number three in the nation for women killed by men in single victim, single offender homicides. 
And I say that because I bring a name to the forefront. Um, my cousin, who was killed October 12th in 2016 in California, her name is Vanessa Bobo, and she was 29 years young. She was killed by her fiance while she was holding her 11-month-old son, who was nine days from turning one years old. And her five-year-old son was in the house. She was shot multiple times. And it is also recorded that she was shot at Point Blank Range while she was holding her baby. Um, and this gentleman only received 35 years for the life that he took. Um, and he, he gets to live longer than her life. He's serving a sentence longer than her life. Uh, so those are reasons why we cannot um, go let the month go by without recognizing domestic violence and what that stands for. And lastly, I know y'all saw I'm wearing my blue and orange. It's not just for thunder. It is Langston University homecoming. <laughs> it's um, my alma mater. We're celebrating homecoming, H the only HBCU, which is historically black college university in Oklahoma. It was um, founded in 1890. So this Saturday, after you leave the ribbon cutting, drive to Langston, Oklahoma, <laughs> and celebrate with us. And um, this Wednesday, there's going to be an event at LUOKC, which is on the same grounds as Millwood. And that's from 6.30 to 9.30. But uh, the game kicks off at 2 p.m. versus Texas Wesleyan University. And if you have never been to a Langston homecoming, please. Make this the year to put your L's up for Langston University. So with that, uh, I hope to see you all on Saturday. Thank you, Your Honor. I bet you didn't know it today, but it's a very, very special today. Uh, our chief of staff, Debbie Martin, was born on this day. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to tell her uh, thank you. She makes my life much easier on, for the work I do on this horseshoe. So happy birthday, Debbie. Uh, on a second note, uh, and I meant to mention this when we were in the consent uh, agenda, but item 7P is a uh, CDBG uh, funding agreement that we entered into with City Care for a low barrier night shelter for the homeless. Um, if you don't know anything about City Care, you don't know anything about Adam Luck and his staff, you don't know about the City Care Board of Directors, I would encourage you to go look at the great work they're doing on their website. The really neat thing about this, while we're giving $620,000, uh, the City Care Board was able to raise a uh, million dollars in private funding. And this will accommodate approximately 200 persons per night with 60% of the space reserved for men, 30% of the space reserved for women, and 10% for families. So my hat's off to City Care. Thanks for your great work. All right. That concludes uh, items from Council. Item 12, City Manager Reports. Yes. So we have uh, Chris Tatham here with us. He is... Uh, with ETC Institute, and they conduct our, conduct our resident survey, and so he's going to present the results, and we'll hand out uh, copies of the documents to everyone um, here in just a second. Um, Chris, appreciate your work, and appreciate you being here. While they're getting set up, it's great to be back. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our firm, uh, ETC Institute, we were founded uh, 40 years ago uh, this year. Uh, with the primary purpose of helping local governments, cities and counties have objective ways of getting input from residents so you could incorporate that into decision making. We don't believe surveys are the decision making tool, but it allows you to hear from a cross section of residents about a wide variety of issues so you can incorporate that information into the way you're making decisions. Uh, uh, they're going to be pulling up on the screen just a little bit and I think we if that is in there, we're ready to go. So this is just our GWIS maps. It's now past 2.4 million people have been surveyed by our company. Uh, it should be in just the last uh, a decade. We've also done work for more than 900 communities. I've done probably 30 to 35 surveys here in the city of Oklahoma City, or many for the city themselves, but for the chamber and other organizations over the years. So uh, my goal is to make sure that each time I come, you can feel confident that the results you have really do represent what the residents think. And so that way, as you have public hearings and other sources of information, you're able to hear the wide view of the general public as well. 
Today I'm just going to walk through briefly the purpose. I think a couple of you may be newer to this process, so I want to make sure that you're equipped and understand how the survey was done, and I'll go through the methodology as well. I'm then going to hit what I'd consider to be the big takeaways, or what I like to call the bottom line. So this is what it is. Uh, there is so much information in this report, I'm not going to be able to go through it all today, but certainly if you have questions, I'll be around at the end to answer any questions you may have. So the bottom line is to give you an objective assessment of what residents think about community services, what they think about priorities, and a variety of other issues. Uh, we've actually been doing the survey fairly regularly, almost on an annual basis since 2005. Uh, I also include comparisons to other communities so you can see how Oklahoma City stacks up on various issues. Because one of the realities is certain services are just rated worse than others. It doesn't matter how well you do code enforcement, it's rated lower than parks in almost every community. So if you don't have the comparative data, sometimes it's hard to put into context, are you really doing well or not so well? Uh, this year's survey was administered to more than 1,200 residents. We designed the sample so that each of your eight wards gets a statistically valid sample of at least 150 respondents. The overall demographics fairly close to the census estimates for the city, uh, and we these days don't really call people. I suppose back most of you don't answer your phone anymore, so the way we're able to get similar levels of participation that we achieved 10, 15 years ago is we actually do follow-ups by email. And so if any of you were selected, you may have received emails from us, and we've actually found that that encourages people to respond, and it's actually become the primary way we get response these days. The overall results aren't perfect. They have an accurate of about plus or minus 2.7% at the 95% level of confidence. And that just means if you did the survey 100 times the same way with a random sample, we'd expect to see these results within about 3% or less. So they're fairly accurate, and it's a similar process we use each year. This is just a map. Uh, years ago, before GIS was a standard, people used to always say, well, I didn't talk to anybody who got a survey, so I'm sure nobody in my neighborhood got surveyed. So now we just put a, ma a map together that shows the distribution of respondents. And I'll point out, I might show you a few more maps in a little bit. You'll see how low uh, the density of the population, like up in the northeast is. We don't have a lot of respondents, but it's a big area. So if you see an area that's rated, like when you look at the GIS maps, it's in yellow or orange, which tends to be a lower rating, keep into consideration that there may not be a lot of respondents from that area. So I'll try to guide you through the few of the maps, but the maps are there to give you a general sense for is this an issue in a particular location or uh, citywide. And Chris, I think you said this before, but, but basically you go back and test this to make sure that we get a proper distribution within each area. Exactly. So it's, and again, each area there's only 150 respondents, but it generally it's is. It's in relation to the population, Exactly, right? yep, exactly. And we'll check it to make sure things like gender, age, ethnicity, and other things compare closely to the census estimate. So if you look at the race composition of our sample, it's pretty much aligned with what the census estimates are as well. So uh, with that said, here's the really the takeaways for this year from my perspective. And I've been here many years, so I've been here to tell you good news some years. And I've been here other years, not so good news. Uh, this year tends to be really good news. Residents think the city is moving in the right direction. Uh, your overall ratings, we average, there's 82 items on the survey that were rated last year and again this year. Of those 82, most didn't change significantly, but of those that had a statistically significant change, 33 increased by 3% or more only one decreased by 3% or more. And interestingly, the one area that decreased is one of your best rated areas in customer service. You set the standard. So it's like, instead of having a 380 average in a baseball year, you're at 375. So all in all, your ratings continue to be very good. What really stood out to me, given a lot of national trends, is that a lot of folks feel this city is moving in the right direction by a, uh, by a ratio of about 10 to one. And in most communities, it's at best three to one. So people feel good about the direction of the city when it looks as things, uh, how people feel this community is as a place to live, as a place to work. You get some of the best ratings of any community in the country. And finally, uh, to stay there, though, I think the biggest risk is potentially your infrastructure. Your street ratings year after year have not been among the best. Uh, and they are definitely the top priority among the residents that were surveyed. And I'll walk you through that as we go through some of the ratings. So first thing, or just major finding, is that the overall perception of residents for the city is very, very good. In fact, I love coming here because when I 
This is one of the things that I use, and I've been doing this for 30 years, uh, to really say what I want to live in this community is a function of the next, this chart and the next one. And you can look at how highly people rate the city as a place to live, work, and particularly as a city that's moving in the right direction. You'll notice only 8% of folks don't think the city's moving in the right direction. And you probably hear from most of those people. That's the reality. The people who you're not hearing are the 70 plus percent that actually think you are moving in the right direction because they're taking that for granted. What I really like is the intensity of the strong response or the excellence. One in three people not only said you're moving in the right direction, they gave you an excellent rating, which is a very positive, it's an intense feeling. And so right now people are feeling good about the city. Uh, in addition, uh, you see generally citywide that sentiment is felt, but you'll notice as you go out to the east, we get slightly lower ratings. Those are not as populated, so there's only a few respondents there, but keep that in mind as you look at some of the other data. But in the core part of the city and in most of your districts, generally, the ratings are pretty good. Uh, when we look at the overall quality of city services, you'll notice one thing really stands out, and this is the condition of city streets. We break this question down into many areas. We look at more detail in parks and codes and public safety and maintenance issues. Uh, and when you look at this, you'll see that the overall ratings for your public safety services, fire, ambulance, police, very strong. Your utilities tend to be very good. Your parks and recreation also rates fairly well compared to other communities. But as you work your way down, you'll see traffic flow has 39% negative. Interestingly, that's about average for most communities, so that doesn't surprise me. But what does is the perception of your condition of your streets. In your reports, there's a much more detailed section on maintenance. And in that, you'll see 10 different attributes of streets or maintenance that were assessed. And the top two issues are really your major streets and your neighborhood streets are both rated relatively low. You also have some opportunities with the cleanup of litter of debris. Your sidewalks generally rate on par with other communities, and your overall ratings of your bicycle facilities are a little low compared to other communities, but the condition of the actual surfaces of your neighborhood streets and major streets is clearly what is standing out in the data. Uh, here's just to give you an example of how it looks on maps. This is your fire services, and I heard them applauded a few times today as we were going through things. You have great ratings for your fire. It doesn't get much better than this. Pretty much everywhere in the city uh, gives dark blue, which means the average respondent is giving you a rating of five, which is just tremendous. You see ambulance services is also very good. You see high ratings uh, throughout the city. Police services is generally good. Again, there's not a lot of respondents from the Northeast, but it rates a little bit lower. But then when you come to city streets, you'll see pretty much the entire city uh, is in orange or red, which means it doesn't matter really where you live. And I think one of that's challenges are you're just such a big geographically, when I look at you compared to many other cities, the amount of geography and streets and roads you have to cover is just tremendous. And you can see that's where a concern pretty much regardless where people live. With that said, we looked at some of the trends. As I told you, the overall direction of the city is definitely perceived as favorable by your residents. Uh, again, of the 82 areas that were assessed both last year and this year, 31 or 34 had a statistically significant change, and 33 of those were positive. Only one was negative. Uh, people actually noticed the streetcar. You'll notice it was the number one overall perceptions of transit were up 16% compared to the previous year. Curbside recycling, athletic programs, Oklahoma's ratings as a place to visit, the quality of your downtown and the image of the city all increased by more than 6%. I didn't list all 33 because there are just so many. Those are the highlights. The only area that decreased was how well employees handled customer service issues but your customer service ratings, when I show you in the comparative data, are among the very best. So I'm not really concerned of the slight decrease because it was borderline with regard to statistically, statistical significance. When I show you some of the things is how you stack up, some of the reasons I'm making these comments is that when you look at Oklahoma as a community, as a place to live, work, and even the city as a mo place moving in the right direction, look at how you compare to other communities. 
And what's shown in this is we do a national survey of over 4,000 residents each year, and we also take a look at what size of community the respondents live in. And one of our subsamples is what we call large cities, where there's more than 250,000 people in that community. And that's shown here in the orange bars. Uh, the national average for all respondents is in yellow, and you can see Oklahoma City is in blue. And all of those critical ratings, you're above the national average for all cities as well as large cities. But take a look at as a city moving in the right direction. Most large cities, only 42% of the residents or less than half feel good about the direction the city's hit moving. Here it's 76%. And again, only 8% gave negative ratings. So very healthy. When it comes to the major categories of services, you'll notice your uh, fire services particularly. You'll notice that's the best rated service in pretty much every community. Here it's rated even better than in the average community at 89%. You'll also notice that the one area customer service that we saw a little decrease is really setting the standard, particularly if you look at customer service, which is a little over halfway down the list, 59% compared to a national average for large communities of just 33%. So when it comes to making residents feel good about the way they're treated, the way they can get services, the way you respond to them, you're definitely setting the standard. And as you work your way down, you'll see your public transit service went up 16 percentage points. So last year you were way below the national average. You're moving in the right direction, but there's still opportunities to do better. And you can see your traffic flow numbers, though there's a lot of negativity, uh, you'll notice that it's actually about on par with most large communities. What's not on this chart are the maintenance ratings, and they're in another section of the report. But I can tell you that overall condition of your major streets rates 25% below the national average. And that's the biggest deficiency you have compared to other large communities, or really the national average period. When you look at some of your utilities, I just wanted to highlight these because frankly, this says a lot about your employee culture because these are the people who deliver the services day in and day out. And you can see whether it's the residential trash folks, bulk item pickup, curbside recycling, wastewater, overall customer service and speed of service. You can see that across the board, you've got great employees who really care about your residents and that perception is felt by the residents who are being served with this. If you don't have good utility services, that usually means you don't have good customer service because that's the majority of the contacts that people tend to have. But with that said, there are opportunities to do better. One of the questions we asked is of those major categories of services, whether it's traffic flow, police, codes, parks and recreation, or of course streets, what is the top priority? And this isn't new information. This has actually been this way now for a couple years. More people pick the condition of your streets as their number one priority than any other items top three combined. And more than eight out of 10 picked it as one of their top three. When we look at this information in the context of the analysis that we do to identify priorities, the importance of improving your streets stands head and shoulders above anything else. And this is how this analysis is done if you're not familiar. We look not just at the satisfaction rating, we also look at the relative priority that residents place on the service. And the reason for that is if nobody cares about the service, probably not going to notice if you do anything. And if you make it better, they may actually think you spent the money in the wrong place, which means you might need to educate them if they don't think it's important. But if they think it's important and you're not doing well, that's likely to put the city's long-term position as a city that people really think is moving in the right direction at risk. The maximum value for this can be a rating of one. The lowest value is zero. I rarely see a rating more than 0.5. The rating for city streets is 0.73, and that's because only one in nine people is satisfied, and 83 or more than eight out of 10 think it's one of your top three issues. This is definitely an area I recommend increased investment. And one of the lesser cost ways to do it, I was actually looking at the data since I spoke with the city manager, is actually things like the cleanliness along your city streets is actually one of the things I notice is a potential opportunity that isn't gonna cost as much as paving them, and that may be an opportunity. And I'll be working with the city to try to identify some further ways to do that as we move ahead. Traffic flow is second, but that's not an unusual 
number two choice in a city that people want to come to. So that's a good thing to have. Usually I tell high performing communities their number one problem, traffic flow. If no one's coming to your city or your downtown or anywhere else, traffic flow usually isn't an issue. So if you have a problem, that's usually a better problem to have than some of the others. And you'll notice that code enforcement and public transit kind of round out the top four opportunities. This doesn't mean that fire is not important, but if your goal is to maximize overall satisfaction with the city and continue to get people to feel that the city is moving in the right direction, the items with the higher IS rating will have a bigger impact on that over time. So just summarizing, this takes us back to that initial chart that of those 82 areas, I think you can be really pleased with the overall trend that the city is moving in. Uh, again, the city's ratings as a place to live, as a place to work, things like that are just incredible. And your top priorities haven't changed a lot from the last couple years. But I did, before I conclude, want to just share a couple other things from the transit survey we did of your riders. One of the things that we've been working with Embark every couple of years, I know a couple of you are on the oversight panel for that, is just to really find out, are you meeting the expectation of the riders? Uh, every other year we do one of non-riders to find out what might get them to ride, but this year we actually did a survey of the riders, and we actually surveyed 1,783 passengers on pretty much all your routes. And we also looked at the differences between people using streetcar and just using the buses. So very accurate data set. And one of the things that we found is in all the areas that were assessed, everything from perceptions of safe operations, the cleanliness of the buses, the ease of locating stops, your current users of your buses give very good ratings. The fact that you look at this, most people are giving you not just good, but also there's a high percentage of excellent in every area. So those are your fives on the five point scale, very low levels of dissatisfaction. And this year, when we compared the results of this year's writer survey to the previous year's writer survey, the results were up in just about every area, which was really great. When we looked at the streetcar, it was off the charts. And you gotta imagine, sometimes people think there's just 5% of folks out there that are cranky and don't like things. Well, with your streetcar, you have 92%, you know, on down to 75, you can see that are giving you fives in almost every category. And your streetcar is new, so this is usually where things start off if you roll the service out correctly. Some communities don't roll their streetcars out well, and they don't get these kind of ratings. So what this says is your new streetcar, you did a great job rolling it out, your customers have received it very well. In fact, you can see there's almost no dissatisfaction in any of the areas that were surveyed. And of some of the highlights in the report, Embark Service is now getting its best ratings ever. So there's still opportunities to do better, but you're getting the best ratings you've ever had. And the Street Star satisfaction ratings, as I said, were phenomenal. Several of the areas didn't have any dissatisfaction, and we asked more than 200 riders. The other thing we found that was really interesting is a lot of times people look at uh, transit service as this social service that's just helping people who don't have jobs. When we look at the data, most of the people using it are low income workers. They need transit. They don't have other opportunities. And so this is actually an important service for the region's economy if you're getting those low income workers to and from the types of jobs or employers that need low income folks. And we also found that its service on weekends is becoming more and more desirable and more and more important to folks. And so as you raise the quality of the service, expectations are also going to rise. And so that's one of those things you have to be aware of. As you're doing a better job delivering it, people are going to expect more from you. But that's pretty typical of any organization that's a service provider. Last two things is Embark should continue to ensure that buses operate on time and that stops are accessible to riders. When we did the analysis, much like I showed you for citywide priorities, those were the two things that stood out in that, re, in that result, or in that analysis that said that Embark should continue to emphasize these areas. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with the overall results uh, for the citywide survey. This was a very good year. I know I've been here some years when the results have not been so good, but I look at the survey as kind of a well health checkup. It's kind of nice to know even if things don't change, how things are, and all in all, your residents right now feel really good about where the city is and where the city's headed. So, Mayor, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'd be happy to answer them if they do. I'm sure they do. It's hard not to dwell for a moment on the yeah. 76 to 8 yeah. um, right direction, wrong direction numbers. That's incredible. We should bask in that for at least a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let's keep it going. Anything down here? 
Yeah. Um, as someone with a the critical theory background, I really appreciate you asking us to pause uh, with the good news there, because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really not good at that. I, <laughs> I only, my brain is literally wired to only see the problems and fix them, and I hate that about my brain. <laughs> so yes, good, good, that's good news. Could you speak a little bit about our city streets in comparison to other uh, cities our size? Uh, when you say that we're that much lower, like what is going on in these other cities? Who's doing really well at this? What are their funding sources? That sure, that's a great on? question. There's a lot of cities doing really well. I mean, San Antonio does terrific. Uh, they're very good at the condition of the streets. Uh, Austin's not so bad, but their traffic flow is terrible. Mm -hmm. So just if you can look at some cities do better in some things than others. Your ratings are actually among the lowest of any large city in the country. I have hate to say that, but since you asked, that's the reality. The average is typically for condition of major streets in the 30s to 40, depending. Cities to the north get worse ratings than cities to the south, which is a little unusual because you're actually considered south in our analysis. Uh, and your average has been running 9 to 12 percent in the condition of the streets. And so what I like to do is say, well, what is the likely cause for that? And is it because your streets are not the condition of the surface? Is it because you have issues with sidewalks I mean, bicycles and things like that? They're all things that are very important. And so one of the things you'll look at is if we go to a section on maintenance questions, there's actually about 10 attributes of maintenance that are rated. And there's opportunities pretty much in every one of those areas. But the area that really stands out is not just your major streets, but also your neighborhood streets. As I've been in some communities where, frankly, the DOT just doesn't hit here of the highways, and so the blame is the Department of Transportation. And I'd like to say that was your simple answer. Just tell the folks at the state legislature, which is nearby, that they need to fix their highways, but unfortunately your neighborhood streets don't rate much better. And your sidewalks actually rate okay. They're not great, but they're, I think they're around 42%, which is on par with most other communities. Your biking facilities, I, or a couple points below most other large communities. I think you're around 35 and it's maybe 38. But when you're at 11% for the condition of your streets themselves, the actual surfaces, and the average is 30 to 40%, that's really uh, noticeable. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why I think that's kind of the standalone issue on that important satisfaction compared to anything else. San Antonio, for instance, how do they fund their streets. You happen to know yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know that. And it's different. And it is one of those things if the city is interested, <coughs> I've worked with the city manager and others, we can provide a list of here's some of the, I mean, probably the best example to see a city that turned things around is Kansas City. Because mm. their ratings, uh, if you go back 10 years before their last mayor, and they just had a lot of issues getting, it wasn't getting voters to approve the funding, it was getting the projects let. And so they fixed their process for getting the projects let. So they've seen their ratings go up significantly. Uh, over the last decade. And so they're probably one of the most improved. So sometimes those are the ones to look at is can you find a comparable city that has seen increases that's larger? And that would be one that I would look at. I just don't know what Kansas City's funding sources are compared to yours. And that's usually, you know, if you have dedicated funding sources, those cities tend to do better. But a lot of that depends on the legal uh, framework that you're working in within your state. Thank you. A um, question about traffic flow, traffic congestion. Uh, I think it's something that we really need to stay vig vigilant right. about uh, as, as our population continues to grow. And so can you tell me some of the cities that are getting really favorable ratings on traffic flow and traffic congestion and dealing with the problems that come with that? Yeah, and off the top of the head, the only reason I know San Antonio is I just to look at the results a couple of weeks ago, so we do so many of these. Uh, so that's what I would probably recommend is if you'd really like that answer, I can go through and pull out. We actually do work for 11 of the, or excuse me, now it's 12 of the 20 largest cities in the United States. So we can pretty ident much identify here's the ones that do this well. And, Here's the ones that don't do it so well. So if you're interested, I might pause and I can probably get that information. That way I don't misspeak or go on. I would like just to say, I mean, kind of touching on both of those questions, something that I think our minds typically go to is like, oh, well, we need to figure out how to move cars faster. Or, oh, we need to resurf. We need to like fund all this money to resurface our streets. But coming, I, and I guess sort of like James coming from a critical thinking background, I come from mental health background, and we always know that prevention is cheaper than intervention. 
And so when I think about quality of our streets, I think, well, how do we get more cars off the road? And I think about traffic flow, and I'm assuming that traffic is specifically defined as vehicular traffic, automobile. In a community like this, yes. Um, so I think, well, if you got, well, it's not, there isn't traffic, we are traffic. When we are in a car along a street, we are the traffic. Um, so I think about investing in our public transit system and seeing that the ratings have improved and that the frequency of service is a question or a, a piece that people really want to see um, and that we know from other research that investment in uh, frequency of service creates opportunities and likelihood that more people will use that service. That's where my mind goes. So just kind of want to insert that in the conversation because I fear that we have to, we're thinking, oh, we need to do all this investment into repaving our streets, which is true. I just took a tour with a woman on the south side who showed me some particular problem areas that have been around for decades um, that she's experienced. But at the same time, you know, I think, well, if we had less cars coming into downtown, if we didn't induce demand by creating more parking spots um, along the streetcar route, maybe um, we would uh, we would take more cars off the road, encourage people to walk, bike, use the bus, um, and and do that preventative work along with the intervention. So that's all I have. And to piggyback on that, I reference my trip to New York City for the public transportation conference, and where the Hilton is located on 42nd Street. I mean right next door is the subway entrance. And it did not matter. I never once looked at the time or looked at times like uh, that were posted. I just knew that every two to three minutes, depending on the time of day, maybe 10, another train was coming that was just going to take me down to the Bronx or, or to Brooklyn or up to the Bronx or wherever. And that's that frequency that councilperson Hammond is talking about, and I'm excited about the bus rapid transit that we're going to have here, and I can't wait to go to Houston to see more of that in action, because that can get us that 10 to 15 minute frequency. But uh, yeah, until our regular bus fleet has that frequency as well, people will opt for the automobile. And I want to be a bit bold here and say, when people suggest to me, and they don't do it often, but sometimes they will, that we are just a car culture here, and that to ask for that sort of frequency for the bus is kind of a waste of time because people will not adapt to that. Yes, they will. How we design a city is how people interact in that city. It's as simple as knowing that the wind will come sweeping down the plane in Oklahoma. So I hope someone listening to that keeps that in mind as we move forward and we have opportunities to invest and increase frequency for our buses, and I suspect we will. So I'm encouraged by that. Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you again. Great to be here, thank you. We have a couple of other uh, city manager reports on no presentations. Sales tax report is on um, the sales and use tax. Sales tax, last couple of months has been really good. Um, we're just a little bit above target right now, so feel pretty good about that. Um, still talking with our economists, they caution that going into the latter part of the year, we'd expect to see it slow down some still, so um, pretty much on track with what we've expected and how we budgeted. We also have the IMSA care annual update in here, and if you look, if you look at the numbers, you'll see that our percentage, particularly on, on single family residents, our percentage went down slightly. Our total percentage coverage down to about 70% from 72. But our total number of those that are covered in there has gone up. So we have more people taking it, but it's just a larger percentage as a percentage of the population. I mean, a smaller percentage as a percentage of the population. So we'll continue working with them so on that to try to make sure people know about the program and uh, how to get signed up for it. And that's all that I have. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes city manager reports. We have item 13, citizens to be heard. And we've had a few who've signed up, and we have, we'll start with Jennifer Griffin, followed by Joy Reardon. And um, Jennifer, if you just come to the podium, state your name and address, and keep your remarks to three minutes or less. And I have a handout, a couple of handouts. Can I? Okay, Does sure. Great.
Good morning. My name is Jennifer Griffin. I'm a regional property manager with the Michaels organization. I represent our Oklahoma and Kansas portfolios. Um, with me I have Latasha Wilson, who is the community manager for London Square Village Apartments. This is an apartment complex that we have um, that I provide oversight for. Um, we, are, we are really concerned about some things, and we wanted to come here today to elevate these concerns related to safety of our residents. We have um, a vacant lot that is adjacent to our property that is extremely overgrown. It is littered with debris, trash, and other types of filth. These lots are so overgrown that we are concerned for our children that have to walk through these lots to get to their school bus stop. The, they, they do this each morning at the end. They go to the intersection of Melrose and Metamora. Um, cars traveling on Melrose really can't see these children. They can't see them until they get right on top of them because it is dimly lit and because this vegetation is so overgrown. We are also very concerned about dangers that can be in this overgrown vegetation. Could there be stray animals, wildlife, sexual predators? We don't know. Additionally, Oklahoma City police officers that, that we use to patrol our property, we use them as off-duty officers. They have expressed the same safety concerns related to individuals that shouldn't be on property, that are possibly fleeing pursuit of officers. This is an area that they can go to to hide as well. This presents additional dangers to our residents, to the children, as well as to the officers themselves. 28 complaints have been logged in the Action Center database. How some of these complaints can be closed out as resolved, nuisance abated, is beyond us because clearly this issue is not abated. The information that I have handed out um, to Councilor Greiner as well as to the City Manager and to the Mayor um, show pictures of what we're dealing with. The flash drive I've given you is additional pictures we have taken. Um, we have gone through the database and have listed out all the complaints and whether they've been resolved, etc. It is our understanding right now there is an open complaint where the owner has until October 29th to rectify the situation. We do not feel this is likely to happen because it never does. So my question for you today is, what are we doing next? What are the next steps here? Um, are we going to hold this owner accountable? Or are we going to, again, close it out, say that it's resolved, where it's not resolved? You, you know, that, those are our concerns. Can I be assured that something is going to be addressed with this? Or are we going to continue to allow these conditions to get worse? Are we going to allow um, someone to be injured, and then we will be reactive to the situation? Um, you know, that, that's what we need to know. Um, currently, at our property, we have gates on the east and west side that block off 6th Street. Um, if we cannot get resolution to this issue, we are going to open those gates. And that will be, again, become an entry into the property so that we do not have to have the children going that way. That won't be our entrance to the property any longer. There will be another option. While that will be a positive, change for us, I don't see that being a positive change for the neighborhood. I absolutely see them having a concern with this because it will bring an increased amount of traffic. So basically, what I want to leave this with is I am welcome to have a meeting to discuss this issue further. I encourage each of you to come visit our property, to come see this for yourself, and then ask yourself these questions. Would this be OK in my neighborhood? Would this be okay next to my home? Would I be okay if my children had to walk through this to catch the school bus? Thank you very much. Thank you. For your time. Is this uh, one? Craig, yeah, yes. uh, can, we, can we look into yes, why, I'll, why, I'll, why, I'll these, get together. We'll why these this. things have been mm -hmm. closed out, even Thank though you. it doesn't look like it? it? You know, there are a couple of, com there's one complaint in particular that when I talked to representatives from um, the Action Center, the resolution says closed special circumstance. What does that mean? They couldn't give me an answer to what that means as well. So we, we just need to get this resolved. Yeah, we'll look into it.
Yeah, I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks for bringing it to us. Thank you. Joy Reardon, followed by Ronnie Kirk. Um, I guess I got to pull this down. <laughs> um, three things, and then I'll wait for y'all to answer. Uh, what is our ADA standards right now? What standards under ADA are we in the city uh, under? I'm not really sure what you're asking. <laughs> is there something? American with Disabilities Act? Yeah. Or what is the standard are we running? The city running? Is it 2010? Is it 20, uh, Is it before 2010? Yeah, I'm not real sure. I'll have to find out. I don't, I don't, I don't As know the mayor answer. knows, I just went through the ADA uh, right. workshop. Under the 2012, most of the problems that, that I keep bringing up every time I come to the council meeting would fail. Why can't we at least try to get to the, at least the 2010 standards? Do you know, and I'm also working with the, uh, your council on the disability. Right now, the average, I think they said that there's 3,000 uh, citizens in, this, in the city of Oklahoma City, at least 3,000 citizens uh, for ADA. And it's getting more and more people every day because of the aging population. Why do I have to come back every two weeks or every month and ask about the ADA stuff? I know that it's and a priority for us and we're responding to that, but you can't fix all those things all at one time, but it's definitely a priority. And as you raise issues to us, we look into those and look at those specific issues. But I'll find out for you exactly which code or which um, standard. standard that we're following right now. And the other thing is with the transportation, what y'all don't see, and if you talk to the Enbark people, the, the, as it called, Enbark Plus, which is the smaller buses, are getting overran with people needing that service. Mr. Cooper, you, you want to elaborate on that? Thank you. Yeah, this is something that um, Embark and my transportation board spoke specifically about uh, during a committee meeting on Friday, and it's something that we're addressing right now. We've seen an increase in request for service at the same time that we've seen some staff uh, changes, and so right now it's about that you know strengthening that restaffing process, but then also finding uh, ways to better respond to people. Um, as they make these requests, but you know, I think it kind of speaks. When I joined COPPA, I think one of the most shocking things for me to learn was the extent to which Embark sees themselves as a customer service entity, and whereas I just think of it as like transit. You, you, you hop on, you go, yeah. and, and you make sure it's the, everything's frequent and on time, but Embark really goes that extra step with stuff like, you know, making sure that we offer, you know, Embark well, or for people 60 and over, uh, to be able to have service at their front door. Um, but as we've been offering those services and more people become aware of them, that demand is, is growing. And so that's something we're going to have to take into consideration uh, going forward. But it's something that Embark's fully aware of and then they um, educated the, the trustees on as well on Friday too. So. Also the fact that uh, the vehicles that they're using, uh, they're, ne they're getting the larger buses, yes. But the, uh, the newest buses that for, because I use the plus system, the newest bus they've got is a 2015. And they're breaking down more and more. I hadn't heard that one as much. What I'm hearing, thanks for sharing that. What I'm hearing a lot right now is that there's increased you know, call time, uh, wait times, that things going to voicemail. And like I said, as Embark addresses that through making sure that that staffing is available, um, We'll be able to hopefully make those. Uh, Nighttime's atrocious. Is that when it gets? Yeah. Um, After the, the regular people go home, the most people that use the night side of it, and I'm one of them because I'm a student, uh, and I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to actually get uh, the Enbark dispatch number because of me going to school and everything and getting out of class at, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. And 
I would say to anybody, if you're experiencing any of these um, you know, issues whenever you're trying to, scheduling seems to be really at the forefront of it. Yeah, um, because yeah, more people are needing the service. Needing the service, especially as you mentioned aging. Um, feel free, to anyone listening or watching, reach out to my office and we'll connect you with Jason uh, Fairbrush there at, uh, at Embark and uh, we'll see what we can do to address that. Okay, but yeah, the, the ADA, if, if you look in the papers and everything, New York being prime example are getting sued because of the ADA violations and stuff. And I don't want to see uh, the city council or the controller and everything have to pay out millions and millions of dollars because of lawsuits. That's the reason why I keep bringing this up and everything to make y'all even more aware of what's going on in our community as far as the ADA as community, that way y'all don't get these lawsuits because the more lawsuits that y'all have to pay out, that's money taken away from and proving that part of the ADA, the sidewalks, the, the ramps. Um, I've brought up several issues about a ramp in my area. One, one little alleyway in my area, one side on the east side has a ramp that goes to a curb. On the west side of the street, there's an ADA ramp and then they, they did a repair on the sidewalk and put a curb back in, which how it got past the, uh, the city inspectors where they weren't forced to put, a, put that ramp in is beyond me. So. I would also just like to note for anyone watching and everyone here on council as well, Joy, there's a um, documentary, a uh, philosophy documentary called The Examined Life, and they do interviews with contemporary philosophers, about 10, 15 minutes each. And it's on YouTube. And one of them, if you type in Examined Life and Judith Butler and Sonera Taylor, Sonera is a disability advocate. Like that's, that's her philosophical work. And in that documentary, they do a walk. I mean, she's in a motorized yeah. um, chair as you are. Judith is not. Judith's walking. And they, they move around San Francisco and get to see Sonara um, be able to navigate a city. So you talked about ease of traffic earlier in that research. To see Sonara with those ramps and to be able to move around the city um, because San Francisco has... Uh, prioritized people uh, with disabilities. And I really, that's something, I mean, I really take your point in a lot of ways. And about the city manager's point, I know this is something that we're moving toward and that we're wanting to uh, address more and more. But yeah, I mean, just for a moment, everyone up here should really think about what it would be like if you were in one of these chairs and you encountered over there at Melrose, right? Um, you will know a city by how it designs its streets. And if and it's designed for people with uh, disabilities, then it will be better for everyone else, every child, every senior too. Um, so th again, that, that's on YouTube. Examine Life, Judith Butler and Sonara Taylor. Watch it and get a bit more perspective on that. So thank you. And right. to thank give you all a point, one quick point. Okay, real quick. Um, I got my chair, this chair, on November 18th, I've got 1,449 miles, so I do know what I'm talking about when it comes to the ADA stuff. I, this is my legs. I walk the city. Well, I ride the city. And I would have more than that if it wasn't for the bus system. But when I bring these issues up, I would really like to know that someone to get back with me and to know that y'all have looked at these issues and not just me feeling like, yeah, you're a bobblehead. I'm sorry, but it's, that's, and it's not just me, it's, there, I know for a fact a lot of the ADA people are watching y'all when I bring these issues up. Because they know pretty much every two weeks I'm gonna pretty much bring up the same issue is with the ADA stuff. So, okay. please. Thank you, Joy. I'm sorry, I went over my time. <laughs> Ronnie Kirk.
First of all, I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to apologize. I'm a couple of papers short. I had some kids I'd mentored ever since they were kids and now they're cross country truck drivers and they came through and I, I gave one of y'all's papers. <laughs> this is about, uh, I went to P. White Center where Congresswoman Kendra Horns spoke and had a conference for mental health. You know, in the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing this young kid, six years old, he wanted to go meet one of the World War II survivors. So the kids, their, their minds, they're trying to understand everything we do. When, a, uh, when all the schools have the lockdowns, can you imagine when all these different parents are telling their kids why their school was locked down today? All the different parents don't even tell them the same thing. So when these kids all go back to school, they're all ages, and they're trying to understand what's happening. Their mind is so confused about why our school was closed because somebody was driving by by the day because the parents are telling them all kind of they're not even telling them the same thing so another thing is I knew chief of police you know a couple of months ago we had people getting killed in their own houses with no guns not even a threat to the police so why are we going to handicap all of our police throughout the whole state of Oklahoma by get instituting these guns where they can have guns for the police to think everybody's got a gun that they stop. They shouldn't be put, uh, be handicapped when they're just starting out. They're trying to get this justice reform going and we handicapping all our police throughout the whole state. Not just a few of them, but the whole, all our police. We're hand, we giving them a handicap. Oklahoma coming, we came so far, so far. You know, years ago, when everybody needed a gun, we were burning down tents, raping their women, killing all their kids. And then the end, our people lived so far apart, homesteading, they had to have a gun to protect themselves and to eat and live off the land. But we're not living in those days and times now. Everybody don't need these guns, and we shouldn't handicap our police. You know, when President Ronald Reagan got shot, oh, who was that? Uh, excuse me. Jim Hankley, the one who shot him. You know, they, that's when they started to... I'm thinking too fast now. You know... Yes, sir. But that's when they started uh, giving people a background check that got a gun. When Jim, uh, when President Reagan got, got shot, you know. So all the people, they do not need guns now. We're not living off the land no more. We're not living miles apart where we had to protect our family and our women and our kids. We're, we're all close together now. So our police department shouldn't have to go into a trauma every time they think they're going to stop somebody. they got to have a gun. All right. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. All right. Last Thanks person to sign up to speak is Michael Washington, who is not in the chamber. That concludes Citizens to be Heard, which means we have concluded all the business on our agenda, and we are adjourned. <laughs>